Hello there, everyone. I'm Dr. Brad Muscle, and welcome to episode one of Experimenting with Existence, where we'll take a look at strategy board games and everything related to them. So as I uh, mentioned in episode zero, uh, where I introduced the series, uh, basically what I'm going to be up to in each of these episodes uh, in the series is taking a close, uh, in-depth look at the areas of life outside of philosophy, for the most part, that uh, interest me the most, right? What I'm most passionate about. And so this episode is going to be no exception to that, right? You're going to, basically, we're going to have, I'm going to offer a deep dive into everything strategy board games related. So just to offer you briefly an overview of all the, the parts that will comprise this episode, you know, I'll start off with part one. I thought it would be best to just begin by establishing what I even mean by a strategy board game. Some of us might not be familiar uh, with the idea of a strategy board game. Granted, they have become uh, a little more popular here in America than when I was first introduced to them way back in 2008. There's still probably, uh, you know, a handful of us who who don't actually know what is really meant by a strategy board game. So part one, you know, again, I'll get into what exactly strategy board games are. And not only that, but um, some important, I would say, uh, at least if you become immersed in the hobby, some some lingo or distinctions and concepts that are pretty common that you'll come across if you become a, a gamer, right? If you become immersed in the hobby of strategy board games. So that'll be uh, part one. Part two, I'll get into, I alluded to like my beginning, you know, in my history then. So I'll get into my beginning in history uh, personally with strategy board games. So that started back in 2008. I'll, I'll go into, you know, what it was that sort of sparked uh, my introduction to the wonderful world of strategy board games. So I'll get into that and I'll talk about what my history with strategy board games has been like uh, ever since. So uh, again, all sorts of aspects, you know, playing online and so on. And uh, part three, I'll get into what I think is valuable about strategy board games, right? Not only playing, but at least in my case and in some people's cases, designing them as well. Uh, so what do I think, um, not only what have I, and I'll talk to this or speak to this, you know, what I personally garner from playing and designing strategy board games, but what do I think uh, people in general get out of, or at least could if they were made aware of these games, what can they get out of strategy board games? So again, that's part three. Part four will actually take a, 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 a look at my collection. You know, so I've amassed quite a collection over the years. Uh, it's been about, what is it, a decade and a half now. Uh, so I'll go ahead and sort of show you uh, what my collection looks like. I'll go into maybe some of my favorite designers. Uh, so I've become pretty familiar with some of the more popular, well, a lot of the board game designers that are published, uh, and particularly the more popular ones. And I have, over the years, have come to establish my own personal favorites, right? When they put out a game, I, I'm very eager to play it. So I'll go through some of my favorite designers. Some of my favorite games okay, that'll be part four part five i mentioned that i design games myself i'll actually get into then what that's like you know at what point did i start designing games pretty much right when i started playing playing them but i'll get into that more what the design process is what what that looks like for for me at least uh, you know and how, what it's been like meeting other like-minded people i'll get into actually that's been uh part six when i i'll get into entering a design contest then and, and meeting like-minded people. Um, so going back to part five though, I'll get into again, the design process for me, some of my favorite designs, uh, go into, you know, with respect to some of those favorite designs, I'll show you uh, some of the boards, uh, probably a, give you a glimpse of a lot of the boards, if not all of the boards, but then give you a, an in-depth sort of look at some of my favorites of my designs. And then, like I said, then uh, it's been nice over the years, sort of coming to meet like-minded people, especially those who are, designers themselves uh, because there there's not a, a whole lot of people that you know they're, they're, that play game play these strategy games to begin with and then there's you know few, far fewer who then actually design them and so meeting other like-minded people especially when they're doing so is so infrequent um, that is always an enriching experience and uh, rewarding oftentimes so I'll get into uh, one of those experiences when I entered one of my designs very early on when I started playing and designing games back in 2010 what my experience was uh, entering the 2010 Rio Grande games design contest uh, where a buddy and I drove up to Mo to Milwaukee to enter this contest 
to enter my game into this contest. And then part, uh, what is it, part seven, I'll get into then my interaction with a publisher. You know, it was pretty brief, but it was interesting sort of uh, what that process is like. And that sort of piggybacks off of uh, the previous part because the winner of that Rio Grande design contest, actually their game was going to be published or it is published by Rio Grande Games. And so if I could win that contest, right, I was guaranteed then to have my game published. Um, so again, part six, I'll, I, you know, I had a, a, a publisher show some interest in some of my design. So I'll get into kind of what that experience was like, um, or sorry, that was part seven. And then part eight, I'll go into the final part. I'll go into uh, UMKC, University of Missouri, Kansas City. They have an entrepreneurship scholars program, which I entered and completed back in 2013. And so I will dive into, you know, what that whole process was like. And so that was completely different for me. You know, it's one thing to design games. It's a whole nother thing to, uh, which this program was geared towards. It's a whole nother thing to try to market and sell, you know, your designs, right? Totally different process. Uh, and so I'll get into the dynamics of that and what that experience was like for me. Among other things, just to foreshadow, it was a very worthwhile experience. I learned a lot. Um, I fleshed out a lot in terms of you know game design and so on. But I one thing I definitely learned is that I'm not a salesman. Uh, the business world is I'm not cut out for the business world. I am a creative design sort of person, not you know pitching. I I can't I do don't do well at least um, at least I don't enjoy you know pitching things, selling things, trying to market those ideas that I've designed and so on. So I'll elaborate more on that again in part eight. So let's go ahead though, without further ado, and dive into part one then. So before we go any further, we ought to, right? We're discussing strategy board games. It probably behooves us to establish what exactly a strategy board game is, right? Um, we're doing a whole episode up over, you know, our on strategy board games after all. So. Um, by the way, strategy board games, AKA, also known as Euro games. So if I use that expression, one of the things I'm gonna do in this particular part is try to um, articulate what certain terms and concepts mean. But if I say Euro games, I mean the same thing, strategy board games, okay? They, they're synonymous. Right? So we'll go ahead and get into, you know, articulate, well, what exactly is a Euro game or a strategy board game? You know, the first thing I mentioned right off the bat is just like the name strategy implies, these are games that involve thinking, planning ahead, right? So it's not only strategy, right? So they're referred to as strategy board games, but another term, and we'll um, kind of work out the nuanced differences between these two terms, but another term you hear, hear a lot is tactics. Uh, these games are tacti tactical too. And so um, both, right, strategy and tactics reflect that these games involve thinking. And that's really the thing that I guess here at the outset I would want to emphasize, right? Is that what stands out about strategy board games is that they involve thinking, planning, right? You have to exercise the mind, so to speak. Right? So hence, at least this was true for me, another thing I'd point out is they're not usually the games we grew up playing, at least if you were like me growing up in America back in the day, you were playing games like Candyland or Life or Monopoly, these sorts of games. And that is by all means not what we mean to pick out when we refer to strategy board games. It's not those sorts of games, uh, which if you think about it, you don't really play those games. You're not really making choices or deciding things. A lot of times the game's playing you, right? You're drawing a card and you're doing whatever the card tells you, or you're spinning a spinner and you're moving that number of spaces and that's it. Right, and that's that's what I mean by it in the sense that the game's playing you. Uh, um, that's like almost the opposite okay, of what uh, at least I have in mind when I think of a strategy board game. Right? Strategy board game, it's the opposite of having no control whatsoever or thinking not at all, like you do when you spin a spinner or you know just draw a card and then do whatever it says. Right, you're actually there at least there's involved right this thought process this thinking element is involved okay now whether that be uh and again we'll get into strategy versus tactics here in a moment whether that be sort of long-term planning i.e strategy or short-term adjustments to whatever the current game status is i.e tactics 
there is a lot of thought involved, right? thinking involved. And so that's the major, I guess, number one thing I would emphasize when it comes to strategy board games. And I would begin again by when you're trying to carve out or flush out what we mean by strategy board games, it helps to juxtapose them with, at least if you're like me, the games you grew up playing, right, which are entirely um, dictated by chance, usually, right, and the game is playing you. That's not the case with these strategy board games. A uh, closely re re related kind of distinction to this point I have been making is it, in the gaming world, so if you become a gamer, right, you, you become immersed in this uh, hobby, one of the distinctions you oftentimes hear about is like Ameritrash versus Euro games, okay? And so um, I wouldn't say like Candyland even constitutes, right? Those games I mentioned earlier, um, you know, if they're going to qualify as one or the other, Ameritrash, Right, so it's just a hobby name, right? I guess it'd be like a dysphemism. Uh, a hobby name for a certain type of game, right? And those are oftentimes contrasted with Euro games or strategy games. Okay, but I don't, um, so in some sense, right, piggybacking on the, the last point I was making, the games we grew up in, a, in some sense, are grew up with are in some sense of the Ameritrash ilk. The idea in general with Ameritrash is that you're rolling lots of dice, uh, lots of you know interaction and battling, um, and the strategic elements, the thinky elements, they're they're usually a little bit lighter on that. Now that's not to say that gamers don't enjoy Ameritrash, right? And that's why I hesitated to necessarily associate games like Candyland, Shoots and Ladders, and so on with Ameritrash because no gamer likes Candyland, Shoots and Ladders, so on, where there's literally no decision points at all. There's no decision making. Uh, but some gamers do like Ameritrash, right? And I guess, again, the reason why I'm going to this distinction now is because if you were going to associate those games that a lot of us Americans grew up playing, right, those luck-driven games where they're playing you, if you're going to associate them with one or the other, I would say it'd be Ameritrash, but again, I hesitate to do so. And I wanted to flesh out what exactly, if you come across those you know, labels, Ameritrash and Euro games or strategy games, what exactly that those labels are meant to depict. Again, Ameritrash are games where there's lots of die rolling, lots of battling and interaction amongst the players. Uh, and it, there's a lot more luck involved typically. Uh, whereas again, with Euro games or strategy board games, the luck involved is is minimized and there's a lot more strategy and tactics uh, certainly much more strategy involved long-term planning okay. okay so i wanted to talk again uh, about some important concepts uh that you will come across and, it, and i started you know doing that here with the meritras versus euro games but can, i wanted to continue to do that and as we proceed here, I'm actually going to, I mentioned the UMK in the introduction. I mentioned that I participated in the UMKC's Entrepreneurship Scholars Program. And as part of that program, I had to do all sorts of businessy uh, assignments, including ultimately completing a, you know, a business plan, a full out business plan. And so, you know, in the process of doing all this, I um, broke down a lot of stuff that is then relevant for this episode. So I'm actually working with a lot of stuff that um, I used back in that, that program. So including then, I wanna talk a little bit about this idea of mechanics. So another board game term that as you become more immersed in the hobby, you'll come across more and more. And all we mean by mechanics, as I mentioned uh, in, uh, what was this called? Gap analysis. I don't. I forgot what all these business assignments were, but one of the assignments I had to do the sort of this breakdown and consisted of a PowerPoint. So I got into some of the the key concepts involved in strategy board games. And again, I'll say a lot more about that program and what I was up to in the last part of the episode. But I do reference again the idea of mechanics when in one of those PowerPoint presentations. So as I say there, right, it refers to the main elements involved in the general gameplay. And so I get into I'm not going to go through all the ones listed, you know, on that PowerPoint slide, but um, I go, go into several of them then that I discussed in that particular presentation. So again, in general, it's just sort of a game, an element of the gameplay 
uh, a major element of the gameplay. And so um, all, all the board games then, uh, when you describe them or hear them describes, described, oftentimes you'll hear what mechanics are or what are the main mechanics in the gameplay. So it might be, for example, I think I have card drafting is one of them, right? The idea is um, you, everybody if that's playing has the same pool of cards that they then usually one at a time, right? Take turns selecting from. I'll go through um, a card drafting game, go through it in more detail, one called Seven Wonders in a, in a later part of the episode, uh, where it involves that sort of card drafting mechanism, where actually in that game, you have a hand of cards each player starts off with a hand of cards, draws one, passes them to the next player, draw, and then with their new set, draws another one, right? That's an, that's using the mechanic of card drafting. That's one form of that mechanic. Um, worker placement, that's one towards the top of that uh, PowerPoint slide. That's, uh, that mechanic involves, that's actually one of my favorite mechanics. Uh, a game like Stone Age, one, a game I really enjoy playing on, for example, the online site I play on, primarily is Yukata, and they offer uh, the game Stone Age, and I love playing it two players against the, you know, another really good player. It's, uh, again, this sort of back and forth, really thinky uh, experience that, that I enjoy. But anyway, Stone Age involves this mechanic. It's one of the most well-known or famous examples of a worker placement game, right? You start off with a pool of, say, is it five workers, I think, in Stone Age? Uh, and you can grow your family in the game Stone Age. You can get more workers into your pool, um, but you have these five workers and then one at a time, everybody takes turns with their workers, putting the worker out on a particular area of the board where they then get to do that action. And the idea is once you put your worker there, usually then nobody else can go and do that same action. So you're, you're you and only you, or you and only a select few others who go there will be able to perform that action. So worker placement, that's another example of uh, mechanics that you will find in uh, uh, games. And again, that's an example of one of my favorites. Another example of one of my favorite mechanics involved in, game, in games, and one that's probably pretty straightforward and easy to understand is trading. I like games that involve trading of some sort, right? Where that will automatically, right, involves interaction with other players. So I like games where um, you know, there's that element of trading always at play because it keeps you one concept concept in gaming is known as downtime. How long do you have to sit in between your turns or how long uh, of, of periods of time are there where you're doing nothing, right? And usually with games of trading, that is minimized because you're always or oftentimes at least able to make trades with players even on their turn. So I like games oftentimes that will employ the mechanic of trading where you can trade various resources you've acquired during gameplay with other players. So anyway, that's the idea of mechanics and what we mean by the notion of mechanics in these strategy board games. So another, moving right along in that PowerPoint uh, presentation that I had to do uh, for that program, another concept that is pretty weighty, pretty heavy, um, that you'll come across sometimes the more immersed you become in the hobby is the concept of weight how heavy is a particular game so we have on the one end of the spectrum what i would say are the lightest of the light the ones that play you where there's literally no thinking at all involved games like shoots and ladder shoots and ladders or you know candy land where you're drawing a card and then just going to that spot Right, that is as light as it gets. Uh, so, so what is this idea of weight? It sort of describes, um, in some sense, how thinky the game is. That's the best way to kind of, as I mentioned, I guess at the top, that's the first thing I mentioned at the top of the PowerPoint slide. And if you were to try to describe it in one general way, it would be, you know, how thinky is the game? And I break it down, or I broke it down at the time in terms of thinking of it in three sort of aspects, you know, how complex is the gameplay? Right. There are a lot of different elements involved. Okay. One of the things I've really grown to love over time and that I shoot for in my own designs is simple gameplay, right? Not a lot of rules, but then using not a lot of rules, offering very deep gameplay, right? Where using not a lot of rules, um, the game still allows for a lot of uh, you know, variety in terms of the gameplay itself. That's the sweet spot, right? 
Um, because I think games can be, you know, I don't like uh, a heavy game where there's, it's overly complex, right? There's too much going on. There's too much involved. Uh, but that then backing up a bit, right? Gameplay complexity, how complex is the game, right? Um, how much is going on? How much is involved? That's one of the factors that then determines how heavy the game is. The more that's involved, the more moving pieces and parts, the heavier the game is going to be considered. Right? Then, as I mentioned, the strategy sort of luck element, right? How much do you have control over versus how much is the game playing you? Kind of what we've already been getting into, right? The more players have control, the more that strategy and tactics is involved or are involved, um, the heavier the game is going to be considered, right? The lighter games are going to be the ones where you don't have to think at all. Right, where it's, they're basically entirely luck dependent, where the game again is basically playing you, you're just following along. Right? And then the third element I reference uh, in the presentation and the PowerPoint presentation is the time involved investment. And I'd say that probably matters least, at least in my mind, in terms of characterizing these games in terms of their weight, but it does matter, right? Longer games in general are usually implicitly are more complex, right, in the first sense. Um, so the, in general, long, the longer a game is, the heavier it tends to, to be referred to, right, or to be characterized as. Okay, so how complex is the gameplay? You know, how strategic is it? How thinky is it? Although that's the general descriptor I've been using, right? And then how long is the gameplay, right? How long does the game take to play itself? Those are all involved in kind of deducing or you know estimating the weight of a particular strategy game strategy board game okay blah 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 and so i referenced one really cool strategy board game site i can't believe i haven't mentioned it yet i'll be getting into it and you know referring to it throughout the rest of the episode i'm sure is board game geek and so you know, I reference at the very bottom of that slide uh, the scale that users on Board Game Geek use to assess the weights of the various games they play and own. So you, one of the things you can do if you're a board game nerd like me is you can establish a profile on this website, Board Game Geek, uh, and then you can, you know, estimate what you think the weight of these various games is, and you use that scale. So, you know, if you like shoots and ladders or Candyland for me, I would be estimating, uh, you know, I would be rating that a one in terms of its heaviness, its light, you know, go all the way to uh, the five. Um, Phil Eklund is one designer. I don't expect, you know, very few people are familiar with him. He's uh, involved in a lot of controversy lately, but anyway, his games tend to be very meaty. Uh, they would be up towards the, the very heavy end of the spectrum. Uh, somebody like Uwe Rosenberg, who designed a very popular game back when I was getting into the hobby known as Agricola. Um, his games can be fairly heavy. Agricola was one that I would say tends to be on the heavier side. So, and a lot of, you know, games then fall somewhere in the middle, most of them probably. And I would say if I had to pick kind of my sweet spot, again, I don't like super long drawn out games. I personally don't mind them, I guess. It's not that I don't like them. It's just, you know, for kids, time is definitely an issue, you know, work, work and so on. So, um, my sweet spot, given all the factors at play, is really like two to three, right? Medium light to medium. Granted that I'll play basically anything. I love strategy board games. I will play basically anything, sands, candy land, shoots and ladders and that stuff. I literally don't think I will play that, those games anymore. Maybe if a kid really, you know, looked at me with a really sad expression, maybe they could, um, Pokes me into playing, but the point was, in general, I'll play almost uh, anything. But, so, having said that, I prefer that certain weight. I'll still play almost anything. Um, okay, then I wanted to get into so talk about weight. I've been alluding to strategy and tactics all along. I think I even might have briefly defined them earlier, but I wanted to get into this distinction in a little bit more detail now. So we have strategy versus tactics. Um, so the general difference, and I would say again, they're both involved in what makes strategy board games thinking. And you could, I would argue, just as uh, be justified in calling them strategy and tactical board games. 
Um, now, granted, I guess the more strategical a game is, the more thinking it's going to be, and that's and usually the case with tactics, but I guess maybe not as much. Um, anyway, so what is the difference? So strategy refers to the long-term planning involved in um, strategy board games, right? What you have an effect over long term. So a game that's deep in strategy is going to sort of a couple ways you can look at it, I think. Um, the decisions you make, they can have long or they do have long term consequences. And you, therefore, you're able to make meaningful decisions, not only in the short term in terms of what happens in the game, but long term. Right. And that pays off in these games doing so, having a mind for and planning for the future right? and having a strategy in mind pays off in these games that are high in strategy. Um, another sort of factor at play when it comes to the strategy aspect of these strategy board games would be there's usually like different paths to victory. And so this is one of the points I reference in the uh, presentation, uh, I think the second bullet point. Right? Oftentimes, games that offer a lot of strategy, there's going to be different ways to win, right? Different paths. So maybe the winner is the person with the most points. A lot of times that's the case, but there's going to be lots of different ways to get points, right? Or, or sometimes even there'll be different winning conditions, different ways you can win the game. So um, that then is going to reflect strategy, right? Uh, long term, you have different goals depending on, you know, which winning condition you're going for. And so there's these games that are rich in strategy or deep in strategy oftentimes will have different paths to victory or even different winning conditions. Now, tactics, conversely, so think of strategy as being long term focused. Tactics is more short term, right? You are so it's still thinky, but you have to react to um, changes in the game state immediately. Like, they, like uh, um, something's drawn and so it um, affects sort of you know how good your hand is right you have to make these tactical adjustments to how the game is playing out so a game that's rich in tactics has you constantly on your seat right because you have to be appraising everything that's going on and be ready to adjust at all times so tactics is reflects sort of the element of these strategy games where you have to think about and adjust to the ever-changing states of the game as the gameplay progresses. Okay. Um, blah, blah, blah. So I think that, for the most part, captures strategy versus tactics. Um, I guess one, maybe one or two more here. Uh, last sort of thing, I one or two more things I want to flesh out would be this idea of luck and randomness. Okay, so you get a lot of discussions about the luck involved in these games. And obviously, I already mentioned how the more strategic a game is, oftentimes it's going to involve less luck. But that's not always the case, right? A, a game that's high in luck, that's not mutually exclusive with a game that's high in strategy. You know, a game could be high in both. But usually, I would say, um, you know, a game that has a lot of luck or randomness involved, right, where that means you don't have control. The more luck or randomness involved in a game, the less control the players have, right? Um, the more that that is the case, the less control they have, right? The less thinky or strategic the game tends to be. Okay, so again, what do we mean by luck or randomness? It's the, the degree to which a game is out of the player's control, right? Uh, so take a game like chess, which has, so one of the things I wanna talk about is perfect information. This idea of perfect information. Chess basically has no luck, right? Perfect information means the players know everything there is to know. Right? In some sense, it's completely deterministic. You could just, based on a certain move, plan, figure out exactly what all the possibilities are and so on. So a game with perfect information, something like chess, it's going to have... No luck, no randomness involved. Other, I mean, you could say, I guess, in some, it's not really random, right? But what your opponent does, you don't really know that part. But other than that, within the game itself, there's no element of luck or randomness. Okay? Um, and so on the complete opposite end of the spectrum then is 
the sorts of games where um, you have no control, right? You don't know any of the information until you draw the card or spin the spinner, right? And again, that's indicative of a game that has a high luck or randomness value, if you will. Um, blah, blah, blah. So, I, you know, what do I prefer? I would say um, most gamers, right, strategy board game players, they're not going to like a lot of luck or randomness. However, having said that, I don't like typically games with perfect information. Um, now, granted, one of my favorite games of all time, if not my favorite, you know, the favorite would be Torres, and that, you know, uh, one of the ways I like to play, there is perfect information. But generally, I don't like um, perfect information. I do like a little bit of randomness or luck sprinkled in. Otherwise, it becomes too deterministic. That's the word I used earlier, right? It's um, it almost doesn't seem like a game anymore. It becomes like an exercise in who is willing to invest the most time sort of seeing where all these possibilities go, right? Um, I don't know if I explained that very well, but for me, it sort of loses some element of the fun factor if, it, if you know everything that's going to happen, right? Because then, you know, why am I not here just calculating, right? Every possible move in this chess game and so on and so forth. So I like and I don't know how well that was explained, but I like some element of randomness or, or chance sprinkled in. Granted, some, right? Not a whole lot. Okay? I prefer, in general, for the luck or ran randomness in my strategy games, the sweet spot would be very, very low, but some of it. Right? Uh, I think that's everything I wanted to say, really, in terms of fleshing out what strategy board games are. So hopefully you have a pretty good idea now. You could even go to a, a, a board game a convention and know the lingo, right? We've gone through all sorts of different concepts and terms that you'll hear flung about if you do go to a, a board game convention sometime. Uh, so we, again, established what strategy board games are and gone through a lot of these different um, related concepts. So in the next part of the episode, you know, I'll get into my own personal history with strategy board games. How was it that I was first introduced to them? And then what has my relationship looked like with them ever since? So now having established what strategy board games are in part one, I'm going to move on to part two and discuss my history with these board games. Beginning with my fateful first introduction, I have a vivid uh, memory of you know, how I was introduced to strategy board games. Beginning with that uh, fateful introduction, you know, progressing then through the years and to, you know, nowadays, you know, what does my relationship with strategy board games look like? So I'll talk about, again, my introduction and the history with uh, these strategy board games. So I alluded to my introduction to them. I, again, can vividly recall what my first experience with a real strategy board game was, if you, if you will. Um, so I guess let me preface that by saying I had played games like a little bit more advanced than, you know, the ones I referenced in uh, part one, Chutes and Ladders, Candyland, Monopoly, The Game of Life. I'd played games like, say, Risk. Um, I don't think, uh, maybe even dabbled at that point with, say, Axis and Allies, but I'd never played anything else up until the point, I want to say it was maybe the summer of, yeah, summer uh, of 2008. So my daughter, we just had my firstborn, my daughter, Abigail, and she loved to take naps on dad's chest. And I remember oftentimes as she would do this during these summer days, going on to Xbox Live Arcade back when I had this opportunity, right? When I didn't have four kids running around and She'd be taking her nap, and I would be playing this game that I stumbled upon called The Settlers of Catan. That, my friends, is was my gateway game, what they call, or those in the hobby refer to as gateway games. Introductory game that, you know, going back to the idea of weight and how heavy is a game, they're on the lighter end of the spectrum, right? Games that can then lead to you know, if the person is, becomes interested, like was the case for me, lead to then diving into much heavier games. Uh, so this was the proverbial gate gateway game for me uh, The at the time. So, you know, what the popular gateway games are um, change, you know, as you progress through the years and certain games become less popular and so on. 
But the two that were by far the most popular when I first uh, got into the world of strategy board games was Catan and then Carcassonne. And I have the big box for Carcassonne here, which means that, you know, so that after games become super popular, they'll release big boxes for them where they become the, the regular game and then all the expansions or at least some of the expansions that have been released, you know, since the original game. Um, so anyway, this though, granted I have Carcassonne and played Carcassonne, it was really the Subtler's Catan. In particular, playing it on Xbox Live Arcade, that was my the, the experience that stood out to me where I was like, whoa, what? This is awesome. You know, what is this? awesome game where you have to think and um you know you can build uh, resources up and establish like certain strategies and do different uh, paths to victory as i referenced in uh, part one right what what this this game this kind of a game exists i was four and i played it uh, i you know i've re referred to in my videos i think especially you know episode zero how obsessive I am. And I played that game constantly when I first discovered it. Like probably literally every time Abby was taking a nap, I was playing that game. Um, and so that was my first introduction to the wonderful world of strategy board games. Once I discovered these games existed, I moved on. You know, I played Catan and not, not only was it my introduction to strategy board games, but it was the, the, the gateway game for many, many others, many thousands of others as well. Um, so it's, been immensely popular again carcassonne was uh, was extremely popular and still is as well now personally i will say that i've moved on in some sense i can't even tell you the last um i've moved on because it has a little bit again going back to what i discussed in part one it has a little bit too much luck or randomness for my liking um you know what you're doing in, in Catan is you're gaining resources kind of based on die rolls so there's still die rolls in Catan, right? Uh, and so hence, there's going to be some luck factor, randomness involved. And so you can have the best numbers in the game in the sense that the most likely or probable to roll. And then just because fate would have it, right, during the game, don't roll. And so, um, you know, the idea is over time, that probably is all a wash, right? The, hot, the better numbers really do roll more often and so on. But the fact of the matter is, in Catan, you can play really well you can make the most optimal decisions possible and still just lose through no fault of your own. And so, again, great gateway game. While it's my interest in it has waned over time, I, you know, I'll never lose my debt of gratitude for the game and for introducing me to the wonderful world of strategy board games. Um, granted, again, it has a little bit too much luck involved, given you know, the point I, I raised earlier, uh, a little bit too much luck involved for me nowadays, at least given all these other great games I have as well. But having said that, it still has a, a spot in my collection because, again, it's a great gateway game. If there's, uh, a, you know, games with a, certain, with a little bit more luck, um, those are great games to pull out when you have gamers and non-gamers playing together because it's going to mitigate, right, the more luck you throw into the game, it's going to mitigate more of the... Um, the, the advantages of the, the gamers would have, right? Those that play strategy board games often, right? It's going to mitigate their natural advantage um, and put the non-gamers sort of more on equal footing. So there's a, a, a place, certainly a place for this sort of game. And not to say like non-gamers are you know dumb or anything like that, but hopefully you get the idea, right? That the strategy board gamers are going to be more familiar with how strategy board games work in general. And and so that's obviously going to give them an advantage uh, amongst other things. So uh, again, great ga gateway game, still a great gateway game, still has a spot in my collection and will never lose, I will never lose that debt of gratitude I have for again, it opening my eyes to the wonder, wonderful world of strategy board games. I do have one of its expansions, Traders and Barbarians. I've played this game so many times online as well, where you can play, you can find places to play not only the original, but then, you know, the, all the expansions as well. Actually recently, so uh, went over for a game session with my son and his friends and then some of the dads and they had a, by mistake, bought an extra copy of the five to six player expansion and said, here, you can have it because we can't return it anymore. Um, although, I, like I said, I don't remember the last time I played Catan anyway. So I don't know when I'll be pulling that out, but um, that's my Catan stuff. And again, 
Uh, Klaus Teber, Tabor, I'm not sure how you actually say his last name. Thank you, Klaus, for again what you've done for me. I will never forget it. So that was my introduction to strategy board games. Granted, I had played, you know, Risk. I wouldn't really consider. I guess there's some strategy involved, but there's dude, there's just too much again. Rolling dice and randomness. It's kind of, I guess, maybe for me, in between like the games I grew up with as a kid, like Life, uh, Monopoly, Chance, or sorry, uh, Shoots and Ladders, Candyland, and so on. And then in between those kinds of games and like then actual strategy board games, if you will, Risk would be somewhere in the middle. It's kind of on the way. And it's not even to Catan, I would say. So, but I just want to say it wasn't as if I had never played anything like this. Risk. Right, and so far as that's close to a strategy board game, I had played that maybe like a handful of times in my life. But otherwise, I'd never played any strategy board games until I discovered Catan, and that again opened my eyes to these kinds of games. Uh, I started, I should say, like one, once I started playing, it was almost instantaneously that I started also designing games. It's just I have a very creative nature, and so it was almost instantly as I was playing some of these games, I was thinking about the rules and. I wonder why this is this way and you know would it how would it be if it was instead the rules were you know this way uh, would it be better would it be worse and so i started tinkering you know not only so i started pretty much creating my own games right away uh and then in addition like also tinkering with uh um rules and like i said in uh published games games that were already published and so actually preparing for this i uh speaking of risk i remembered you know how when friends and I would play, I actually sort of tinkered with this rule. I don't remember what the specifics were with respect to it, but I created a, a special assassin who then we uh, put white out on the tips of one of each color, right? So everybody, ever each color or each player would have an assassin. And again, I don't remember exactly how he worked, but he was super powerful with certain powers and worked certain ways. So that was just an example of how. Uh, one of the ways I remembered that I sort of would tinker with going way back, tinker with some of the rules, um, you know, decades ago in some of these games. And I was wondering then if, uh, if the whiteout assassin would still be in my copy. And sure enough, I did dig out at least one of the colors had it. And I'm sure the other ones probably do as well. But um, anyway, so that was one example of, again, just tinkering with these rules going way back um, and started designing games myself at that point. So over the years, reference playing like Risk with Friends, a lot of us have probably played Risk, um, a good sort of social game. It can create some uh, intense feelings as well. But I've introduced, so again, I was fortunate enough to discover these games back in 2008. And since that time, I've introduced pretty much all my good friends or tried to, to, you know, strategy board games. They've played, pretty much all my close friends have at least tried strategy board games playing them with me in you know oftentimes my own designs but then also Catan or any other games that I bring to to their house on a Friday night or something like that uh, and so one you know one example of a good friend of mine who graduated he went to a, a KU grad school with me and uh, you know I introduced him during that time to strategy board games and so he became, became very immersed in them as well has a big collection and so whenever you know we live in different places now but then whenever we get together, we will literally all we'll do is just play board games. He, he and I, uh, and for, you know, he has, uh, we both have like gaming groups. Uh, I'm not able to attend mine near as regularly as he is. So he he's able to get his fix maybe a little bit more often than, than me. Um, but, you know, so that that is awesome when, he, when we visit because we're both able to sort of get our fix then and we just play literally, that's pretty much all we do is these strategy board games. We'll literally play like 30, games in a row like he'll oftentimes he'll come visit me stay you know stay here and morning tonight we'll be playing strategy games and the last time he visited i wanted to say we played literally 30 games over the three day visit so um shout out to joe uh we haven't been able to do that as much due to recent events with the virus and whatnot but um thought it would be worthwhile to point out how you know i'm affecting them all my friends and you know, some family members and so on and trying to get them suck them into this what i consider to be wonderful world of um, strategy board games um oh so one other like funny kind of story that uh i guess kind of speaks to how involved some of these games can be too that i remember and then my wife and i will chuckle at sometimes um 
So this is way back, um, way, way back when I first started playing. And this was with respect to Axis and Allies. Another game that's a little bit more involved, right? Definitely more involved. It's a war game, but not as intense as you know a lot of other traditional war games that gamers will be familiar with. Right? It's kind of a gateway game to war games, if you will. Um, but anyway, I remember uh, one time Shout out to Dan, another friend of mine. We were uh, setting up, uh, we're getting ready to ha to play this game. The new game we had just purchased, Axis and Allies. And uh, my wife was leaving with some of her friends to go to a movie, go out to eat and whatnot. And so we're getting ready to play. And she says, have fun. Fast forward, whatever, two, three, three and a half, four hours, whatever it was later. She comes strolling in, saying bye to her friends and saying, oh, how was the game? And I look up and I said, well, we're just about ready to start playing it. So we had literally, right, spent the whole time going through the rules, figuring it out, setting it up, right? So these games, some of these games, right, can be super intense. And uh, that has always kind of stuck out in my mind, um, you know, as kind of an interesting sort of tale, if you will, that speaks to, again, how involved some of these games can be. Now, one of the things I've grown to appreciate, again, is a game with, you know, that's not super complex, that has simple rules, right? Relatively few rules. So maybe like the opposite of, of the Axis and Allies rule set, but then affords deep gameplay, just given that simplicity though, right? Um, and so I think actually Torres is a really good example, arguably my favorite game of all time. Uh, great example of that where, you know, there's not a lot of rules to it. You can pick it up fairly fast, uh, but yet, you will be learning, and I'll go into my experience with Torres here in a little bit. You will go, you will be learning the nuances of the game, hun literally hundreds of games in to playing Torres. Um, so it's much easier to get to the table, much quicker to learn, right? Much quicker to teach, and yet it's just as deep, if not deeper, than the game that took three and a half to four hours to learn and set up. Anyway, nothing against you know access and allies, but just. A point, you know, that I think is interesting, right? That there's something, it's more of a shout out, I guess, to what I would consider great designs. Like, uh, I'll get, one thing I'll get into is one of my favorite designer, designers is Wolfgang Kramer. He's my favorite, actually. And so he and Michael Kiesling designed Torres. And so it's more speaking to the polish or why games like Torres are so good. Right? So Axis and Allies offers some depth, right? It's an enjoyable experience, but again, it can be tedious to set up and, and learn. Torres offers all those other things and yet is simple and easy to set up and learn. So anyway, actually, as I mentioned, speaking about Torres, the next thing I wanted to sort of get into, and that's, uh, I do play, it's one of the things I wanted to mention with respect to the next point, and that's that I play online these days. Actually, I started playing online probably maybe three, four years after I started playing, you know, these physical copies. I discovered, hey, you can play a lot of these games online. Various sites uh, offer, you know, various games for free oftentimes. And so one of the sites that I have definitely played most often at over the years, I think it's... God, so I know it's, if you just look up Yukata, that'll get you there. Uh, over 100 games, you know, published games, they offer for free. And the thing I like a lot about it, if you watched in my other videos, you know I hate advertising. And um, it's ad-free. So really like that site. So shout, shout out to them. Uh, and so I remember playing there, you know, for, for at least a decade. Um, play there. The frequency that I play online definitely varies and depends on what's going on. But I will say, a uh, moment to brag, speaking about Torres, uh, mentioning Torres. So if you go online to Yukata, I'm actually and have been the number one rated player on their website for Torres for uh, quite some time. And uh, it's kind of like I said, a bragging point. But, but mentioning Torres, one thing I wanted to say is so I mentioned this earlier. Uh, it was a hard sort of climb to the top of those rankings. And one thing I vividly remember, I don't remember his exact username, but I remember playing, I think it's like Hawk X was his, his username. I would, and he was super highly ranked and we would have these duels and I would learn so much. You know, this is after playing hundreds of games. I would learn so much about a different sort of play style, his play style. And then I would play 
other highly ranked players who would play completely differently. So again, that speaks to the elegance of this design and how even with very simple rules and not many of them, you can have this incredibly deep gameplay that emerges. And that's what I really like and would say stands out about Kramer's game, Wolf, his games in particular, Wolfgang Kramer. Kramer. That's what I really like about his games in particular Torres. Now, I don't know, I have it, so on Board Game Geek, right, I go and I rank all my, rate all my games, and it's been number one for a long time. I don't know if that's just because I'm number one. That's the one game I'm number one at. I didn't mention, you know, all the other games that I played on Yukata and I'm not number one on or at, right? And who knows how many players, and it's on there, but how many players are even ranked, right, or have tried to play it, but... Um, yeah, so you can go on Yukata, and I play a ton of other games. I mentioned Stone Age. I think that was in uh, part one. I'd love to play Stone Age on Yukata uh, against you know, other really good players. And another game where you will see different paths to victory and different ways to go about trying to, to win. Um, so, yeah, I definitely have enjoyed playing online as well as, you know, physical copies. I've enjoyed playing online versions of these uh, strategy games. I mentioned sort of gaming groups. Uh, my buddy that will get together and play those marathon sessions. He has a gaming group. And I mentioned earlier how you know I've had various gaming groups mentioned going um, to a gaming session with my son and his friends and a few of the dads and how we'll, we've actually gotten together a handful of times uh, for that gaming group, if you will. You know, we'll change where we, you know, we've hosted and other uh, parents have hosted and so on. And I have a, you know, another gaming group. I actually have gamed rather extensively in a group with a former student as well. So, the, you know, I would, I mention oftentimes that two classes that I teach that one of my interests is strategy, is strategy board games. And one of my students, you know, it's probably been almost a decade now, you know, we, during the course of the semester, we would have these extensive discussions on games and, you know, he invited me to check out his gaming group after the semester was over. And it turns out that I actually knew uh, another guy that was in the group who's actually uh lives rather close to me and has a daughter and that's the same age as my oldest daughter so anyway small world and uh have i just wanted to mention that uh i do have various gaming groups that i've participated in played played in as well and enjoy those try to get my family involved as much as possible you know extended family and immediate family one thing i'll say is that like I definitely, you know, people have various views of strategy, of board games in general. And I think one of the issues for, I would say, for people who are sort of not necessarily drawn to them immediately is that they have a certain impression of board games, much like I did, you know, grow, you know from growing up and being exposed to certain games. Now, I personally always liked games, playing games, even those not so good ones, right, that I've mentioned before, Canyonland and so on. Even as a kid, I would still like playing games. Um, but if that's your only exposure to what games are, then, you know, you'd probably be a little hesitant to, you know, get into the game world, right? Well, uh, again, so there's some hesitancy, and I think that that is oftentimes one of the, the sources of the hesitancy is that we have limited exposure, and many of us aren't familiar with all the awesome themes and rich gameplay that is actually available. Uh, and then others just, you know, it's not their thing playing uh, game games, whether they're really cool games, I would say, or those more traditional games that a lot of us are used to. Regardless, they're just not um, into games, or maybe they don't mind playing games, but a lot of people aren't on the spectrum like me, where you could play games seemingly literally all the time. Uh, and so that's been kind of a whole point is that's been kind of an issue I've tried to navigate cautiously over the years, um, because I want my, you know, the people I'm around to want to play games with me, right? I want to have people to play these games with, but I don't want to like overexpose them to it, right? And make it so that they, they're just sick of it, right? So, um, and I think that's, sadly, it's kind of happened with some, with my kids. Uh, as they've gotten older, they just play it so much. I just wonder, like, thinking back, how much I would love to have grown up with all the games we have, right, um, that my kids have exposure, uh, the ability to play, how much I would have loved to have just not necessarily even played them, but to like dive into the games and, and explore the components and the rules and how they worked. And um, But that's, again, that's just not to, for everybody. And when you grow up with that, then it's not as cool, I guess. Uh, and so, or over time, right, even when it maybe was cool, again, if you 
you just get used to it and then over time it's not as uh, uh, as interesting anymore so um certainly something that i worry about and i'm cautious about when it comes to how much i try to play kit games with my kids in my extended family having said that i definitely do and have raised my kids playing games and think it's great that they're exposed to this huge library of strategy games where they will actually, one of the things I'll mention when I talk about in the next part, the value of games is they can offer a great learning experience. You learn about you know, different themes, um, different areas of history and so on. It also helps us, right, I'll get into this more in more detail, but right, the calculated process and then like thinking through things, right? I think that these are all great things. So I'll elaborate on, you know, the boons of, um, playing these strategy games with kids then. But so I just wanted to point out now that, um, so fast forward now, I have four kids always trying to get, you know, a game to the table every now and then with, with the kids. And the younger ones seem to, to be more inclined to play than the older ones at this point. But um, we do still try to get, again, family game nights and certain games they like better, certain themes, and that's true of everyone, right? Um, but yeah, that's more or less, uh, I think all I want to say, you know, so pretty much ever since I was first introduced to them, I've been playing and designing them religiously, strategy board games. Now, granted, with having four kids and as they've gotten older, my time to do both of those has dramatically declined or decreased the amount of time I have for that, that both playing and designing games. But I've always, as much as possible, right? play and design these, these games and that's been true again since day one since my first introduction to them so um just as much involved in the wonderful world of strategy board games 15 years after my first introdu introduction nowadays right, as i was back when i first started playing Catan. uh i guess i'll just end with mentioning so i brought a couple of these others so agricola i mentioned louis rosenberg as being one of the heavier offering some of the heavier games, and this would be an example of one of the heavier games. And I, I brought it to the table, so to speak, because it's one of the first few that I, I purchased. Uh, so that one is an example of one of the first few games that was added to my collection when I first started playing these games. So Catan was one of the first ones, Agricola, Power Grid, also a very famous game amongst game, gamers. Um, Friedman Fries is the designer. He hasn't designed as much stuff lately, but very uh, prolific designer over the years. Power Grid is probably his most uh, well-known game. And then uh, one of my first purchases as well was El Grande, another game by Wolfgang Kramer. This time he designed it with Richard Ulrich, but El Grande is a really um, famous strategy board game, amongst, at least amongst gamers as well. So. Thought I'd show some of the, the very first games I, I added to, to my collection when I first started playing. Anyway, so that's part two. In the next part, I'm going to speak to what I think, and I've already alluded to some of this and foreshadowed some of it, but what I think are you know, the value or the benefits to be gleaned from playing strategy board games, what I in particular really get from playing and designing them, and then what I think people in general have to gain from playing and then for, for the few that also design them what they have to gain from designing them as well so that'll be what you have to look forward to in part three thanks we're about to get real experimental here in this first episode of experimenting with existence because i'm going to you know this is such a deep dive i'm going to add a part two to part two before we get into part three so what ended up happening is as I was preparing to record part three, it occurred to me that I left out a pretty important uh, aspect of part two, you know, my history with strategy board games. And so far as, you know, I left something out with, while it's not directly, you know, strategy board games, it's not directly related to strategy board games, it is nonetheless related. And that is my history with strategy video games, which actually goes far further back. Uh, so I wanted to say a little bit of something about strategy video games and my hi history with these games and how the writing was probably on the wall in terms of me loving strategy board games when I would eventually discover them later, given my love for strategy video games. So 
that's what I'm going to do here real quick before getting into part three, where I'll talk again about, you know, more or less why I think we should play strategy board games, what we get out of them. Um, but okay, so this short spiel about strategy video games and really, again, how that should have been, um, if any, anybody that knew me back then, that would probably have been a good indication that I would like strategy board games later on down the road. And so I guess really, again, it goes, my, my, I was trying to re remember my very first experience kind of with a strategy video game that I really fell in love with. And that goes back to the Sega Genesis. I remember so way back to my, my youth, some of you, probably many of you viewers, no doubt, don't even maybe know what a Sega Genesis is. Maybe you haven't even heard of it. It's a very old school uh, video game system. So this is way back. I went and tried to dig out what I could of my strategy Sega Gen. I actually have some of them. So these are ancient. These go back way, way back to my youth. Tried to dig out what I could. I didn't spend too much time trying to get get uh, the games out, but I found a couple of them that I'm mentioning here. I, I have this vivid memory, okay, going back to playing Sega Genesis and some games in particular on the Sega Genesis. So one of them is this one, Aerobiz Supersonic. Loved this game. Uh, actually, before I played this one, I played by, so this company, Koei, K-O-E-I, um, I became familiar with this company because of my love for these strategy games. Uh, first, the one, first one I remember playing on the Sega Genesis was Nobunaga's Ambition. And I have it somewhere in here, but that's one of the ones I could not find. Uh, so I played that one and, you know, it was pretty in depth and took a lot of time to sort of figure out. But once uh, I did, I, you know, I fell in love with it. And so, you know, there I was as a very young kid, you know, playing Nobunaga's Ambition and, so I'm like, what is, you know, this is an awesome game. Are there similar games like that? And so I began with the company that I mentioned and found basically any anything I could get that they put out, I tried to, you know, acquire then and play. They had one on the American Revolution. I don't remember what it was called. Um, there were a couple other ones, but the, the two that I remember in particular really spending a lot of time playing were Nobunaga's Ambition and Aerobiz Super, Supersonic. So in this one, you're basically kind of, it's it's kind of like a, almost a simulation game, simulation slash strategy. Uh, so you are basically, you own a, uh, an airplane uh, company. And so you're tasked with sort of setting the prices, you know, the flights, buying the airplanes. And, uh, but I love the choices involved and, you know, certain uh, airplane companies that built the parts for the airplanes, they would have sales. And so I love the different choices involved and when, you know, when should you focus on uh, purchasing, you know, airplanes and increasing your supply of that versus, you know, running advertisements and trying to promote certain flights and so on. And so. Uh, and then, then you had to pay, pay attention to your competitors too, right? Who are doing the exact same thing and really loved that and spent a lot of time again playing playing this one. I'm actually trying to get my hands on, so preparing for this, uh, I got, got so nostalgic. I, I would like to go back and actually play this. And so um, I'd like to maybe pick up a, a Sega Genesis. We don't have one anymore, um, but uh, Man, I just remember spending so much time on that. And another one that I did come across that it it, it uh, is definitely strategic and involves, again, the long-term planning sort of thing. And there was a lot of choices involved. F uh, Fight Through the Tyrants. And I spent a ton of time on this one. I remember loving this this game as well. Uh, so those are, so so that goes back to the Sega Genesis era, way back to my childhood, way before I discovered strategy board games. Um, but they were had a very similar feel, and so that should have foreshadowed, like I mentioned earlier, you know, wouldn't be any surprise, fast forward, when I discovered strategy board games, which basically capture, you know, the same sort of feel of the video game, but in a sort of, sort of physical way, uh, there no doubt, there shouldn't have been any doubt that I would love strategy board games as well. Um, yeah, I mentioned how the Sega Genesis, that's really when I remember sort of discovering strategy video games, and then it's probably what, decades later when I finally discovered strategy board games, but I really did love and play these strategy video games. And so my love for 
strategy of video games has never ceased, you know, naturally. Um, why would it? Of course, my time to play them, again, with four kids, that might be minimized. But uh, to this day, I still enjoy playing strategy, strategy video games. In fact, uh, my family would probably uh, still remember this a couple. It's been a couple years, but when Civilization VI came out, I spent hours at a time like immersed in that game. And so shout out, by the way, to the Civilization series. Uh, another definitely blimp uh, in my historical sort of the history of Dr. Muscle's uh, experience with strategy of video games and board games. The Civilization series definitely deserves a shout out and a mention. So when I discovered Civilization, I remember way back in high school going over to uh, a classmate's house and he, he had had up civil this game Civilization and you know, I had asked him about it. I was over to do a, a project, and so, you know, we didn't really play it, but he kind of mentioned what it was like, and I remember thinking that it sounded really fascinating, you know, interesting. But I'd never played it for, you know, a couple of decades, really, until I finally ended up, I don't remember how it was that I finally came to play Civilization IV. But this was a game changer for me. I uh, really fell in love with Civilization IV. Uh, spent... Like I said, hours and hours and hours. And I mentioned a couple of years ago, that was actually Civilization VI. So Civilization IV probably goes back, what is it, seven, eight years? Even further further back than that, a decade ago. Uh, Civilization V came out in between, obviously, in four, five, six. I wasn't as big of a fan, or at least I didn't play Civilization V near as much. But Civilization IV and Civilization VI deserve huge shout outs as far as I'm concerned, uh, because I've, I played those games a ton, and they are arguably my favorite you know video games of all time i would say uh civilization 6 came out on the playstation and uh, so that one i mentioned a couple uh, years ago how i became you know invested in that one that was on the playstation but primarily on the, the cpu some of you guys no doubt are familiar with the civilization series i finally got involved like i said in in iteration four but Civilization 4 and Civilization 6 in particular spent a ton of time playing, love those games. And I guess the last thing I, I have to mention is how it's been interesting, kind of segueing off of the Civilization discussion, how then there is this relationship between strategy video games, strategy video games and strategy board games. You know, uh, in particular, how you'll get when one is, is popular, you'll get sort of that then adapted into the other. So, for example, you've had several examples of strategy video games that have been adapted into, you know, the, so, so games that started off as successful strategy video games. So another one I would mention is XCOM. So further down, right, the console generations, I played a lot of XCOM beat this game. I uh, played XCOM 1 as well on, uh, what was it, Xbox 360 or something like that. Couldn't find that one for, for some reason, but uh, XCOM is an, a, a perfect example of, and that one actually is a, a good one to discuss in terms of this, the tactics versus strategy distinction, because there's both tactics involved when you have these battles with the aliens, and so, so half the game is like you're you're on these missions and you have to take out, let's say, certain aliens or defend certain uh, bases. So half of it's like that. And that is what I would describe as tactical. You have to engage with the enemies and they're moving. And so you have to react to, to what they're doing. Uh, and so it captures that sense of tactics. But there's also then half the game is strategic in the sense that you have this base then that you're developing and you have to decide you know, what elements you want to invest in and, you know, which ones you don't and who you should recruit and what types of uh, soldiers you should, you should recruit and so on. So all of those are, um, you know, examples of strategy that are involved in the game. But anyway, so there's that strategy tactics element of XCOM. But uh, the reason why I was originally bringing it up is it's an example of, to my knowledge anyway, the video game came first, right? A successful strategy video game that then was adapted into a, a awesome board game, I might say as well, a cooperative board game, and it's a, got real-time elements, so that's another mechanic. I don't know if, I, I don't think I discussed that, the real-time element where you, part of what you're doing in the game 
is on the clock, right? You're facing some time element involved. And so <clears throat> that is involved um, here in the, the board game, right? And it's cooperative. That's another sort of tag you get here associated with board games. That just means, right, you're working together. Uh, you're either winning together or you're losing together. Um, so anyway, lots of examples. What other oh, uh, civilization, right? <laughs> another example that of a game that started off as uh, a successful, you know, video game, hugely successful. One that was, uh, as I mentioned, right, a big deal for me. That then was made into board games. In fact, not just one, but I believe three different board games based on, again, the Civilization video game series. This one was about a decade ago came out. The newest one, and I just picked this one up relatively recently. The newest one, this is actually an expansion for it, and here's the original box for it. Uh, that's the newest one based again on Sid Meier's video game, Civilization. And there's a third one, I believe. It might be the, the oldest. <clears throat> don't, don't quote me on that. I'm pretty sure there's a third one, which I don't have, that I think is... Uh, two decades old. And I should have mentioned that going way back to like Civilization 1 or 2, then they released, released a space version kind of of a civilization that was very popular, Alpha Centauri, um, which is again a space version of Civilization. And fast forward, they kind of released something similar based again on Sid Meier's Civilization years later, decades later actually. So this is about five years ago now called Beyond Earth, which again is supposed to be like, provide the civilization fuel, but in space. So, and I should have mentioned one of the cool things that always stood out to me about civilization, and that is again related to something we talked about with respect to strategy board games, is that there's multiple paths to victory. So one of the ways you could win is actually going to space. So if you emphasize science, you can then be the first one to reach Alpha Centauri or whatever, or some some destination, I believe it was that. But you can then, depending on which iteration of the game you're playing, you can achieve an economic victory by amassing so much, you know, wealth. Or you could, in all the uh, series, you can, you know, get a domination victory where you take out all the other civilizations. And one of the cool things about civilization as well is that there's all these historical leaders that are in the game, and so you'll pick one, and they have all these various traits, and so. Certain ones, Napoleon, you know, are more inclined to uh, combat and, you know, taking you out and spying on you and so on. And others, you know, Gandhi, are more inclined to be peaceful with you. Anyway, all aspects of, again, things that we kind of talk about with respect to strategy board games, how there's these dis different elements involved uh, that you have to think about in order to do well in the game. So something that, again, really appealed to me about civilization. But going back to the main point I was starting with here, right, is that we've had very successful strategy video games that have then subsequently been uh, adapted into, often, in some cases, multiple strategy board games. And, and then, of course, it's worked the other way. So I mentioned the first strategy board game that I became familiar with. It was actually via the electronic adaptation of it, you know, on Xbox Live Arcade. That was actually the first word version I played. So there you had an example of a board game, right, that then became uh, a video game, right? So it works both ways. There's definitely this tight connection and relationship between strategy video games and strategy board games naturally. So I think that's all I, I wanted to say. I just wanted to, again, sneak this little blurb in about my history with strategy video games because, you know, I think it is certainly related to my history with strategy board games. So let's move on to part three where we'll dive into the value of strategy board games and you know why it is I think we should be playing them. All right, so in this part, part three, I wanna speak to what I think is the value of playing and I guess also in my case at least, designing strategy board games. You know, why is it that we should bring them to the table, so to speak? Why should we play these strategy board games? And so, you know, in this part, what I'll do is, I guess, more or less lay out a catalog of what I think the benefits are of playing these games. And so I'll say, I'll speak to what I think people in general can get from playing these games, but then I'll also, especially towards the end of this part, I'll uh, emphasize what it is in particular that I 
get from them. Why it is in particular that I love these kinds of games so much. And you probably already kind of got a sense for that from the, the first few parts. Uh, but I'll dive into again much more depth in terms of why it is that I in particular, you know, love to play these games so much and, and design them. And I should say that um, much like was the case, you know, in uh, when I laid out right part one, when I laid out what strategy board games are, you know, I'm going to borrow from in some of this borrow from my experience in the UMKC scholars program where I created a business plan more or less, right? From these uh, for, for these the strategy board games that I designed, uh, I'm going to so in that process again I had to do all these various assignments and so I'll borrow uh, some of my discussion right I actually sat down and really thought about uh, what it was that we can get from playing these games and so I art, tried to articulate it you know what the value of playing these games you know what what that is in some of these assignments and so uh, again I'll work with some of some of what I contributed to in terms of those assignments and and I'll expand on some of that but I just wanted to, to say again and mention that. Uh, I'm working with some of that. And so for in particular, uh, in the middle or towards the end of the, this part, I'll uh, show you some of the tables that I made at that time to represent, again, the value we can get or glean from these strategy board games. So anyway, let's go ahead and dive in then. So what is it that I think that we, you know, really, co the collective we, so not just me, but, you know, what do I get? But what do I think we can get from these strategy board games? And so some of this, I should say, is true of, you know, a lot of leisure activities and not just strategy board games. So I'll say that at the outset as well. Um, and so that's going to be true of the, this first one. But some of them, you know, I'll try to, to mention, you know, some of the things that I'll mention are maybe more so true of strategy board games and not true of other leisure activities. So, you know, I'll also point out things that sort of stand out about them as well. But, you know, what, what can we get uh, from a strategy board game, from playing a strategy board game? Well, like other leisure, leisurely activities, we can have an escape from the trials and tribulations, right, of our everyday lives. So oftentimes we, you know, we have a hard day, let's say at work or at school or whatever the case might be, you know, we had a hard, a hard exam. Whatever we're going through, right, we can escape it, so to speak, by immersing ourselves in one of these strategy board games. And oftentimes, again, the more thinky they are, at least for me, the more immersed I become because, again, it's requiring more of your thought, more of your attention, at least if you want to do well. And not only that, the other thing I'd mention is the thematic elements of a lot of these board games, some some of which I'll, I'll mention here in a, or show you here in a moment. The thematic elements, they immerse you even more, right, in this sort of not your reality the rest of that day, right? They, they, they help you escape even more. Uh, again, given some of those thematic elements. So speaking of which, let's go ahead and dive in. So I brought lots of props to help illustrate uh, some of these points regarding the value of the strategy board games. And so again, I'm speaking to the themes that uh, become vibrant in our experience of playing these strategy board games. Again, they can help us sort of remove ourselves from whatever we're facing the rest of our day, right? And at least for a while, right? To kind of escape from it. Um, which I think, again, we can all benefit from as long as we're not trying to escape all day, right? Uh, it can help provide that and the themes in some of these games just help do that even more. So uh, some examples, Thebes, this is one of my favorite games. It is you're basically an architect digging up, you know, these uh, ancient sort of artifacts, trying to find them. And so you're, uh, what you're doing mechanically in the game is you're digging in. So there, there's these different regions. Uh, different regions uh, in the world, right, that you're traveling to, and they have different odds of getting, you know, certain valuable artifacts. And so you're reaching in and to a bag, and a lot of them are just sand. But, so these tokens you pull out, a lot of them are just sand, but some of them then are artifacts. And so I love that. And the kids, they like this one as well. I love that experience of digging for these, these artifacts and trying to extract these these ancient artifacts. So that's one example of a very thematic game uh, that we like to bring to the table. Another one is Fresco. So one, this is probably the first one that came to my mind when I was trying to think, well, what's a good game to capture the notion that these strategy board games bring a lot thematically to the table, so to speak. And Fresco was the first one I, I thought of here where you're, you are uh, in the game, you're, you're painting, right? Uh, the, 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 the ceiling of a, right, a church. And 
so you have to acquire them. I mean, it's just amazing artwork too in some of these games, really help it stand out. Right, but you have to get the paints together and then you're, you're getting uh, the different parts then and trying to paint the different parts of the, the painting. Uh, very thematic as well there. Fresco is the name of that one. Uh, what else? A oh, Mysterium. That's one that we've been playing a little bit recently. So here's another example of one that I think is super thematic. I'm going to toss those to the side when I'm done with them here. So Mysterium here. And this is one of the ones we've been, kids and I have been playing a lot recently. Where you're kind of psychics. And so it's a... Um, if you've watched me in my other videos and my book reviews, right, I'm not usually into the supernatural stuff, but this is a pretty cool game because you're you're playing like psychics trying to figure out um, who killed this. Uh, so basically, you're trying to help a ghost, right, and figure deduce, you know, who killed them originally. And so it's kind of like um, a deduction game, and you're working and again. It's a cooperative game. You're working together uh, to try to. So the ghost is behind here, and he knows who killed him or herself. So one player is the ghost behind the screen. And they have the identity of the, the very, you know, who actually killed them with what. It's kind of like Clue. There's a per particular character that killed them with a particular weapon in a particular location, right? And they know it at the outset. And so what the game is, most of the game, right, is you're, they're trying to then give the psychics, the other players, these clues in terms of who it was, right, that killed them. But they can't do it. The catch is they can't talk. The ghost can't, right? The the player that's playing the ghost, they can only use clue cards to signal then who these, who it was, what weapon they used, and so on. So, pretty cool um, sort of and uh, feel or vibe that uh, that we get the first time we played it. The first few times we played it, we uh, we you know lit candles and turned off the lights and so on. So another a great example of again a, a game that that uh, is very thematic and can help you very easily escape from reality, so to speak, at least for a while, right? So strategy board games, like other um, leisurely activities, allows us a, a temporary escape from our trials and tribulations. But I think what sort of aids strategy board games, you know, in this process more so than other leisurely activities is again, how thematic they are, at least some of them, at least uh, how thematic some of them can be. Okay, then I gave you some examples of kind of games that I, at least in my collection, that I first associated with being very thematic. So another thing I would point out, uh, a big value that I associate with strategy board games uh, is the educational component and how much you can learn from playing strategy board games. And it really, you know, the more I sort of thought about this and preparing for this, the more, uh, you know, I really agree with this point, how educational playing uh, strategy board games can be. So I brought out some examples um, of, you know, how that's the case, and, or at least, again, examples from, from my collection. And, and not only is it, are they educational, but they might sort of spark interest in things you didn't know you would have had interest in otherwise before you played the game. I guess that's maybe a slightly different point, but right, so they can also introduce you to um interests right spark those interests that you might not have known you had right before you played the game and actually one example that i'll mention real quick to that point for me was and i haven't actually watched a game of thrones yet but i at least became interested you know what actually is that series all about after playing uh the board game in particular actually a nice piggybacking off the previous part two of part two most of my experience uh, with a Game of Thrones, the board game, is the electronic uh, uh, adaptation of it, right? So the on Steam, the electronic version of the game. But anyway, my experience playing uh, that board game or the electronic version of it kind of made me interested. Like, whereas I was never interested in the Game of Thrones, I'd heard you know people reference it all the time. I knew I knew what it was, but you know, now I'm actually intrigued. If it's ever on, you know, and I'm around, I might actually pay attention to it, whereas before I would have never done that. So I just wanted to mention, again, how there's these cases, and that's one that came into my mind, how that was true for me, where you'll play something and you're like, oh, that's interesting, right? You know, I want to explore that more. But again, going back to the more general point where they're educational. So 
here's a really cool game. I mentioned the website Yukata. I'm pretty sure you can still play this on Yukata. At least you could for a time. That was my first introduction to Yukata, and I should, or not Yukata, to this game. It was on Yukata, and I should say, piggy, uh, piggybacking on the whole idea of playing on Yukata, there are several games in my collection where you know I first experienced playing them on Yukata, and then actually I liked them so much that when I found a copy for a reasonable price, I would pick them up. Right, Founding Fathers being one of them. So anyway, this this game is very educational. Right, you have a cool board representing the assembly hall where all these political blokes got together, right, to figure out what they should, what, how to found this con great country of ours, right? Um, but sort of speaking to how educational it is, though, there's so much behind how right, you have all the different political players involved at the time. And what's more is they, their effects and how, what they do in the game mechanically it reflects it's their thematic what 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 they do in the game mechanically is thematic in the sense that it represents what they're known for historically so um again just a, a great example of how these games can be very educational look at the detail that you get that's historical in addition to just how to play the game right there's this historical extra and there's you know the blurb on how to actually play but again on the other side you and you, when it's your downtime, right, it's not your turn, you can literally read and learn about these various characters that you're portraying in the game. Uh, I think, is this the rule book? Yeah, this is the rule book where it goes into detail, right? They didn't have to do this, but that's what they put into the rule book. All this extra detail about all these, again, political figures, right? So, another great example of game I would consider highly educational that is in my collection. Uh, one cool game that comes to mind as being, a couple actually right here, as being educational would be Wingspan. So this was designed by Elizabeth Hargrove, Hargrave, sorry, Elizabeth. Uh, and I don't know what Elizabeth does. It's something she's, you know, involved with birds, and it's something sciencey. Yeah. It's like a bird science scientist or something along those lines. And I should have known that. But anyway, this game became super popular because she's also into strategy, strategy board games, and so she, you know, combined her love of the two and created a honestly a great game, uh, which is interesting too because it's one of those where. You know, it appeals to not only in uh, a certain segment that bird enthusiasts, right, but it also then brings gamers and other people that play it who might not have had that love of birds to begin with. It exposes them to, you know, bird watching and that sort of culture and might spark that interest uh, because getting back to the general point about being educational, naturally, given who the designer is and how academic she is and so on, this is extremely uh, you know, educational in the sense that it portrays all these all these birds that it has in the game. They're all distinct, and it all they all have accurate. You know, their their information is accurate in terms of their habitat, their um, tendencies, and so on. And so that comes out in the game as well because certain birds you're putting into your what is it forest habitat, certain birds in your water habitat, and and, and so on. And uh, again, so you're learning as you're playing and having fun you know, with, with these games. Wingspan, a great example. Uh, one that, again, recently was super popular. I'd almost consider it an example. We talked about gateway games, right? How Catan was my gateway game. I'd almost say it's one of the recent examples of a recent gateway game. Now, it is maybe slightly more complex than something like Catan, but I think it is, you know, simple enough and easy enough where, you know, just average everyday people might get into it and it is a beautiful looking game too so they're you know wow what is it because you actually the dice come out of a little bird house i should have sh showed you that set it up but um you know it's it brings your attention to the game on the table as well it looks nice and it's immersive um so yeah another great great game uh, uh, uh maybe an example again of a, a contemporary gate gateway game 
So that's wingspan. Uh, evolution, where did that go? So on this point of being edu educational, here you're creating a species uh, using these different sort of trait cards. And you, you know, it's, it's very educational in the sense that you have to you learn sort of what's necessary to survive out in the wild, right? And if you have this sort of, sort of trait, then you're maybe more you're able to you gain this advantage. But then this other species has this trait, and you you have a weakness because you focused on this one thing. You have a weakness to their trait, right? So, and it's you know it's all based on um, you know real so to speak real. Um, evolutionary traits that you can get. So uh, what are some examples here? Defensive herding, just going through a couple of the cards here. What's this one? Oh, defensive herding again. Burrowing, right, certain cards, which then again give you, not not to go too deep into what the game is all about and how it works. Here's hibernation, but just to give you an example, examples of some of the traits then that you can attach to your species as you're developing them and as you're evolving them, I suppose. Uh, and so then you have to, it's like a, a fight for food. There's a limited food supply. And some cool thing about this game is you, your, uh, your species can be carnivor carnivorous or not, right? And you, in which case you can attack the other species or not, right? You might just eat plants or you might eat other, again, other, the other species. So there's that dynamic as well. And so as was always, is always the case, right? uh, historically, there's this limited food supply and typically too many, too much population, too many species. And so there's that element involved. But in general, just wanted to speak again to how there's that educational process involved in playing a game like Evolution. Not to mention, so it's called Evolution Climate. This version of Evolution included this climate element where then you have to factor in, right, certain uh, species are in, you know, heavier species are, are are better off in, say, you know, when it's colder in colder environments versus it's better to be lighter and not weigh as much in hotter environments and so on. So you have to factor in then these, these environmental factors and potential other environmental threats. So again, great example of how educational some of these strategy board games are. Love playing this with my kids as well. They got into this one. And again, it's, I feel like not only is it fun to be, you know, engaging in this activity with them, but then also they're learning in the process. Um, okay, kind of speaking to that, how, you know, engaging in this experience with them, with the exception of solitaire games, one benefit of these strategy board games is it brings us together, right? We're doing things together, experiencing an activity get together, right? As Aristotle famously says in politics, man is by nature a social animal, right? We, um, a lot of us think of ourselves as hermits maybe, or think, you know, we like to be alone, but the truth is we need some, most of us anyway, right? Some social, some participation in, you know, social activities, let's put it that way. And so strategy board games, you know, if you're in a gaming group, let's say that, obviously offers you, it affords you an opportunity to get together with others and experience that. So, uh, and you know, again, board games, perfect opportunity to do that. Uh, they are uh, adaptable. So one of the things I wanted to say is like, you know, versus other leisure activities, right? Where maybe it takes two and a half to three hours, maybe you only have 30 minutes, right? We have different games, right? Are playable in different time periods. So. Uh, maybe you have Friday night and you want to get together with your friends, but you won't, you know, a couple of you only have like a, an hour long, you know, an hour, a hour, a, a period of time. You can't go to the movies together, but maybe you can get together and play a strategy board game. So again, these, these offer us a good opportunity to get together and, you know, do something with one another. Consider one of the labels or tags that's oftentimes associated with certain strategy board games after all is a, a party game. And what does a party mean? It means a group getting together, a group of us getting together and having fun basically. And so there's a whole genre of these strategy board games that are known as party games where you get together and uh, it's a group, right? It's, so these games cater to, uh, again, the, the bigger groups. And so you have, what I brought examples here. One, uh -oh. One example that I like, it, Wits and Wagers, I'm not, I'm terrible with trivia. My wife's the opposite. She she remember, remembers all kinds of 
intricate uh, historical details and so on. I have a terrible memory, and so naturally I have terrible trivia. But one thing I like about wits and wagers is that it's kind of a trivia game, but it's not just you guessing. You are then wagering on all the guesses that were submitted. So even if you have no clue what the answer is, you can still do real, really well and win the game, not having any idea initially what the answers were by sort of working off what the other guesses were. So kind of cool uh, element that this brings to the table in ter versus other trivia games. But it's it's known as a, and I brought the party version out, and I actually have a couple different versions of Wits and Wagers. Uh, it's known as a party game. It, this literally can play, what does it say in the box? Four plus, it doesn't even cap it, right? Because you know I've heard of con conventions where they'll get a whole big room full of people playing and they'll, they'll segment them off into say like eight groups where then all the the particular those eight group everybody in a group will work together to formulate that group's answer so this can literally play anywhere from four to hundreds right so it's a, a great example of a party game and one that i in particular like uh what other example oh yeah one night werewolf so you might have heard of this one this is a pretty popular social deduction game where you get together with a lot of uh friends or whoever and you know whoever's in your gaming group and or whatever whoever's there for that occasion you pull this out this is actually one that plays pretty quick so i mentioned you know you can have quick games you can have long games for sale this one plays in 10 minutes literally the first time i ever played this was like five five minutes and i couldn't believe it was actually over um so some of these games again if you don't have a lot of time you can bring them out play them quick uh, what, uh, the reason why I'm echoing that point again is because the social dedu deduction game typically takes, as it says on the box, about 10 minutes. So you play it over and over and over. Uh, typically people are having a lot of fun, that's why you're playing it. Right? So you might play it six, seven, eight times in a row. And so there's these different, uh, different characters that the different players are, and that's their role, and everybody closes their eyes. And there's uh, so a lot, of, a lot of these social games or party games or some of these games in general, I mentioned XCOM in the previous uh, part two of part two, right? They'll have, um, what's the word, apps, right? On the phone, you, that'll sort of be incorporated in the gameplay. And so XCOM is an example, that board game, co-op board game that I mentioned earlier. It, it has a part of the game that requires the, the app. And so, so too, in One Night Werewolf, the app will be going, and so everybody will have their eyes closed, and as the different roles that the players are playing, right? They'll have a token or a card that tells them their role. As each of those roles comes up, the, the narrator on the app will say, okay, um, all the, you know, the witch, you may open your eyes and do whatever the witch does, right? They have, so each character has a unique ability. And so certain, you know, the werewolf's trying to do a certain something in particular, and each character has a certain way that they win, right? But so anyway, that's an example. And there are all kinds of different versions, all these different, uh, they're kind of expansions. They offer you know, more and more characters or roles that the players can play. Uh, so that's an example, again, of a kind of a party game, one that involves social deduction because you're trying to figure out the deuce, right? Who the different people are, who, who your friends are, like what are their roles, right? Who's the werewolf and, and so on. Um, so, you know, all these games, they're great ways of you know, getting groups together getting us together and having fun. And again, very thematic. A lot of these are very thematic. Uh, I mentioned earlier how, so similar to sort of being a, a social you know, experience for us, and I've alluded to how I love playing these games with my kids. So I sort of segueing off that, I wanted to emphasize how I think that strategy board games can offer a great family experience. Uh, so just you know, recently I mentioned how we we've been playing. It's here somewhere, Mysterium. My kids and myself, we played this several times and have really been enjoying this one. Uh, code names. So you know, over the years, Abby, my oldest, she has grown to you know not necessarily enjoy playing them as much, or at least as much as she used to. Uh, with certain games, you know, I. I have a fond I have a fondness for because you know even she enjoys and so I it's something that as she's getting older you know it's harder and harder to find you know things that we both enjoy right because I'm a, a grown man and you know she's a growing you know, young woman I suppose you could say and so when I can find something that you know we can both do 
and that we both enjoy. I love it. And, you know, ideally she'd love to play all the strategy board games, you know, just like I do, but, you know, that's not as much the case anymore, like I said. But one game that she likes in particular is uh, Code Names, and so just wanted to point point uh, that one out, give a shout out to this this uh, this game. Again, might be an example of a gateway game. Uh, another example of a deduction game where you're trying to figure out um, what, you know, based on clues from your partner, um, you know, trying to figure certain things out. Uh, so Abby really enjoys that one. And I wanted to, I'm pointing these ones out because again, they are these particular games because they're ones that resonate with me with respect to uh, the family, right? And bringing, you know, my, bringing my kids up and raising my kids. You know, I've raised my kids then uh, on board strategy war games. And there's a lot to be said uh, for doing that, I think, um, which I'll speak to more here in a little bit. Uh, so I wanted to echo what I mentioned earlier, and that's the adapt, ad, adaptability, or how should I put this? The, in some sense, how adaptable the time element is when it comes to strategy board games. So you have games that play and still offer you that sense of strategy. Now, obviously, if you're only playing a game that's 10 minutes long, how intense can that strategy be when, it, when by definition, you're talking about long, something long term, right? But still, you know, there's still that sense of strategy you, you, you can offer it in a 10 minute game versus, and I don't have too many examples of these, but like some war games and, uh, you know, other war games that gamers are familiar with can take six hours, right? So there is this uh, variability, maybe that's the right way to put it, in terms of, you know, how long do you have on this particular day to engage in a leisurely activity with your friends? Okay, that long? Well, let me find, you know, we have this game that we can play, right? So. Um, they're nice in the sense that, again, they offer that variability. So maybe you have, maybe you have, it's a holiday and you have all day and you're together with extended family. You don't get to see a lot and you enjoy these types of games. And maybe you want the six hour experience, right? Maybe you don't have that. Maybe you literally only have 10 minutes. You could pull, pull out again for sale. So I think that does distinguish these strategy board games from other leisurely activities, at least if you have a few in your collection, right, which then represent that variability that's on offer, which which I do. Um, but I, I guess I should grant that, you know, if you only have a couple in your collection, maybe they're just, I would say typical, right? What's a typical length for a strategy board game? Maybe about an hour. There's no average, honestly, right? There, there's so much variability, but an hour or slightly less, I think is, if I had to say, right, if I was forced to pick out what average, what the average playing length of these strategy board games is, I would say about an hour. But again, it could go anywhere from 10 minutes to six plus hours to multiple days, honestly. And if you've ever played Risk and consider that a, a strategy board game, they can, these games can literally, or Diplomacy, I've heard of the Diplomacy games going on literally days, weeks, and so on, depending on, maybe you have other things going on, right? You might have to put the game on, pause, leave it like it is, and then return to it when everybody can. So anyway, the time investment is variable, something that's variable, which I think is a boon to these strategy uh, strategy board games. Uh, yeah, so another thing that I alluded to, again, in that the UMKC assignments, right, and for that entrepreneur pro program, was and i think it's a good point the notion that as opposed to like let's say going to the movies or going to a sporting event these other leisurely activities a strategy board game um not only is it fun right and provide you satisfaction for that particular friday night but it's long lasting right it doesn't go away the game doesn't end so to speak in the sense like that that particular baseball game you went to right unless you buy another ticket you can't play it, you know, you can't see it again next Friday. Well, a strategy board game, right, you buy it, you have it, and then you could revisit it every Friday night if, if, that, if you desire to, right? So, um, again, it's something that you can be enjoyed once purchased again and again and again and again. And, you know, I think there are some classic classics when it comes to these strategy board games that will be, you know, handed down, let's say, in my family from you know, generation to generation. Uh, where you are literally playing these games again and again and again, you know, maybe not every Friday, but once a month for years, for decades and so on. 
Uh, and I would, you know, point out the, the price again is roughly equivalent. So not only is that true, but you're only spending as much as say going to the movies three or four times, right. Or, you know, go, you know, family going to a minor league baseball game or something like that. Right. So it's not like it's a huge financial investment either. Granted, they, you know, they're not necessarily cheap, but if you're going and doing these other leisurely activities, which again, expire well, that night, let's say, is it really that much of an investment when you think about how many times you can actually revisit strategy board games i don't i don't know that it's um that much of an investment when you consider that consider it that way and so you know going through the tables that i created for that assignment back for that program you can see sort of this first table how i broke it down comparing you know what a so kansas city royals baseball game here how much it costs for a family of four Comparing that, right, so how much does all the all these leisurely activities, how much does it cost for a, a family of four to do each one? And you can see that board game is relatively cheap just on the face of it in terms of its purchase price, right? Not factoring in, again, that you can revisit it over and over and over, right? So then that's also true of the Xbox 360 game console, which I list as an example here of something you could purchase for the family of four. Uh, you know, I go through other aspects that you had to, to sort of dive into for these business assignments that I'm not going to get into here. But, you know, as, as you go down um, some of those rows, you can see how I, I'm, again, speaking to how valuable really these strategy board games are in my mind when you consider that you can return to them again and again and again. Now, granted, you have to enjoy playing them and not all of us do. But if you do, right, and you have, I think you behooves you to consider again that that's a huge value when it comes to these strategy board games is that you can revisit them over and over and over you can't go back to that specific royals game that you have a ticket for on that particular date you can't keep you know only spend that initial what is a hundred dollars and keep getting it over and over and over every friday like you can with the board game okay so and then what is the second uh the second table there Again, just kind of getting into some of the values I associate with uh, board games as opposed to other leisurely activities. Another thing, so I mentioned there is you could resell them, right? So they retain value. So let's say you grow tired of them or maybe you enjoy playing them with your kids, but then they left the house. And so now what? you don't really ever play it. You can sell them. Um, most of these strategy board games that are that I'm talking about, you know, and throughout this episode, will have some value. Somebody somewhere would pay you something for for the game if you no longer want it. Um, so you wouldn't just have to donate it, let's say, to Goodwill or something, right? There, you can get something back for it. So that's one of the points I mentioned. Another thing is they are portable, as I mentioned there, uh, as being one of the the assets to these strategy games. Right? They're portable. Uh, more more so true for some of them than others, right? It's more difficult to poke this thing around, right? But say a small strategy card game, a lot, you know, they're pretty easy. Even when it's not that hard even to bring one of these different places, right? So um, portable, all the associated costs, they're minimal, right? That's a benefit to strategy board games. The purchase price lifespan i alluded to that already so that's those tables i want to mention those okay and then finally i guess the, the point i would really hammer home they are you know strategy board games after all oh quick example of another very immersive game right the thematic game shakespeare putting on plays uh, but last sort of main point in terms of their value that i'd want to hammer home and that's that they're thinky right I, by definition as i elaborated on in part one you're going to have to think okay to at least in order to do well or to win and so some people enjoy like a crossword puzzle it can deliver the same sort of you know if you enjoy the challenge of a crossword puzzle it can deliver the same sort of pleasure the same sort of experience as that right uh, playing a strategy board game can deliver the same sort of experience so if you're one who enjoys working out right thinking through a problem and figuring out the solution well you're going to get a lot again from these strategy board games because 
to do well, right, you have to flush certain things out, certain aspects of the, the game state at certain times and figure out what paths to victory are most optimal and so on. You have to make all these different decisions. Again, they're thinky games. So I guess uh, piggybacking off of that and something I mentioned earlier, right, it's one of the reasons why I really love raising my kids with these strategy board games because, again, it does require them to um, to do some thinking, right? So, and how so? Well, in a variety of different ways, right? It involves creative problem solving, sort of um, mathematical. There's a, a lot of math going on in going on in these strategy board games. Again, at least if you want to do well. And my kids, you know, they they're competitive like me. And when we get together and play these games, we're not super competitive, but they they want to win, and so. To do well, you have to oftentimes do math and figure out, you know, if you take this particular tile, right, is that better? Will that get you as many points as if you took this tile? And how will that affect you see that your opponent's going for this? And how much, how many more points would it give them if you took this other tile? And so on and so forth, right? You have to make these kinds of calculations. And I love seeing how the older they get, the more and more of these calculations they're making. And so, um, they have to get creative too, right? And sometimes thinking about the best way to pursue victory and maybe change their path to victory, right? When one is no longer as optimal as it initially was, right? They might have to change their path and that involves like creativity. And so again, I love exposing my kids to um, experiences, exercises where they're, they're having to think on their feet and be creative to do well. And so again, these strategy board games, do that quite well. So I wanted to give you a couple of examples of how that's the case. And actually, as I was kind of thinking about which of these games in my collection did this well, did, that, I, that I remember doing this well with my kids, right, where I could see them kind of like having to calculate and figure things out. And I really enjoyed that. Um, it, it dawned on me that there are certain games, reflecting back on the times, that there's certain ones that I kind of associated with each of my kids where I played that particular game with, you know, Jack a lot and that particular game with Sophia a lot. And so I'll go ahead and mention those as well. But um, a couple of games that kind of stand out in terms of uh, um, sort of, you know, how uh, when I would play these with, with the kids, I could see like them having to figure things out. One of them is this game Martinic. So this is actually the game I remember playing a lot with Jack, my son. And this is a kind of deduction game, but it's only two of you. And the, the game, the, this is the board is a, like a treasure map, and it's showing this island. And at the beginning of the game, there's tiles on all these different spaces of the island, except for these map spaces. And so you're moving your pirates along, acquiring these various things, which are on these tiles and also acquiring these various map pieces, which then give you clues as to where the big treasure is somewhere on the map. So if you notice, there's a grid actually, and there's um, so letters, or sorry, numbers going across here, and then letters going up and down. Well, one of these spaces at the end of the game, right, it's, de oh, it's determined at the beginning, one of the spaces, let's say 36 spaces, one of these 36 spaces is gonna have the big treasure. And so one of the ways you can win is you can uh, guess at the end the location of the big treasure. And if you are correct, you win the game. And the way you sort of piece that together is by collecting these various map pieces that give you sort of, you can deduce the, the different map pieces you get tell you the spaces that the map, where the map's not, right? So you can, uh, but the more map pieces you collect, the more you're able to figure out about, you know, where, where the big treasure is by crossing spots off the list, more or less. And then there's another way to win if nobody guesses where um, the big treasure is. But just an example of where you're again are having to think, right, and deduce, well, I have the H, you know, eight spot, the map, so that can't be where the big treasure is, and I have this one, um, so it can't be there, right? Well, so it must be here or here, right? Putting things together, I just remember Jack, when we played this, you know, seeing the, the proverbial wheels you know, turning in his mind as he was taking his turn on this one. So a lot of fond memories playing that one. And then again, with Jack in particular. Now, one that I played a lot with Abby, my oldest, 
and haven't really pulled out too much recently per se. I mentioned code names earlier. There's so many different uh, expansion versions, I guess. This one, the pictures version, and so on. But that's those. But uh, anyway, Abby, also a fan of code names. I guess that's why I mentioned that there. But uh, one game I remember playing a lot with her was Grave Business. So we don't play this one too much anymore, but you can very thematic, great artwork. Um, but what you're doing, the part, the reason why I'm bringing this up now is there's different tokens on this. I mean, it's kind of macabre, I guess, <laughs> but you're sort of um, digging things up, right? And they're, the different things you can get are worth different, uh, have different values. Right? So four and um, two and so on. And so these are, you know, going across. And so towards the end, you're sort of flipping these up. You're seeing, you know, what the values are. And so at, at the end of each round, players will take turns sort of digging up a row or a column. And so one of the things you have to do is calculate the values. And if you take this particular row, well, that'll leave certain ones left and so on. You have to make all those, again, various calculations. And um, but for whatever reason, the kids really liked this one growing up, and we played this one a lot, and I, I didn't mind because there was enough strategy involved. I, I enjoyed playing it, and I could tell that it was really helping improve their math skills by making these calculations. They would have to, again, do all kinds of math throughout the game. So um, love that sort of aspect of strategy board games. Uh, again, when it comes to the family and raising kids, how... How much it can sort of get them thinking, you know, and it certainly can't hurt, right? What does it hurt to have them exercising their mind like this? So, uh, so I mentioned Abby and Jack, the ones that stood out. So there's Jack and Abby. We played this one a lot. So I thought I would mention real quick, uh, Sophia, my third born uh, daughter. We played loot a lot. So this is a strategy card game. Again, one where you have to do a lot of math. Played it so much, all the cards are getting bent or worth more bent. We haven't played it in a while, but you know, you're doing all kinds. There's different colors. You're doing, there's a long hair in there too. Doing, that's probably hers. Uh, you know, all kinds of math. There's different gold, you know, gold cards and different uh, colors and, and so on. So, um, you know, this is one that's playing like age five if not even four, you know, playing at a very early age. I remember playing this one with her and fast forward now, five years later, and she's very good at math. And I like to think that at least in part, it maybe due to all those games of loot that we played. And I, she'll, she'll uh, appreciate this um, because it's true that she, she really had my number in this game too. I don't know what it was. It, it's not that I wasn't trying. Now there's a, a fair amount of luck in this one. Um, you know, we talked about luck and how that will mitigate, you know, the strategy involved and so on. But she really had my number in this game, too. Uh, I always had trouble, for whatever reason, beating her in loot. So that was the game um, that Sophia and I would play a lot, at least when she was younger. Now, Zoe, my youngest. Uh, so right now, she, you know, she will be seven here in uh, was it, a month, month and a half. Uh, she requests Corinth a lot, is the one she likes, and this is a, a, a dice roller, so you roll the dice, and then based on what's rolled, <clears throat> take turns doing different actions. Uh, so she really likes uh, that one. Oh, and uh, the other one I was going to point out for Zoe is this one called Micropolis, where you're, you're putting together like this ant, ant hill with all these different... Uh, tunnels and there's all these different we talked about path to victory there's different ways you can score points and thus ultimately win the game Zoe's a big fan of this one so if all you know if it's her turn to recommend a game it's usually going to be micropolis or current at least recently so love bringing up the kids on these games really for all the reasons i alluded to uh, makes them think they're fun right? they're a way to get get together, right, uh, and I, for people of different ages. Again, how how many different things do we have, in, how many things do we have in common given these disparate ages at play? Strategy board games oftentimes gives us something to bridge that age gap, I would argue, right? 
whether you're 70 or seven, you can get into a lot of these same games. So yeah, that I, I think I said most of what I want to say in terms of what I find valuable about playing or why I think people should play strategy board games in general. Naturally, going to myself, you know, what do I in particular, you know, why is it that I'm drawn to these? For a lot of the same reasons, basically, you know, I, I love, um, to, you know, think through problems. As I mentioned, you know, I'm a philosopher, I like to think, so that's not that surprising. I'm very created by nature, and so I, you know, love sort of the creative elements that these games afford you in terms of, you know, different ways to win. And then speaking to, so I wanted to say a little bit about designing games too. The creative, uh, I love the uh, the way in which designing strategy games allows me to fulfill that creative desire I have. Right? I mentioned how I'm a pretty creative person, so I. Um, I have to, again, get, fulfill that creative fix, get that creative fix somehow, and I love uh, doing that by designing these strategy games. So, again, strategy board games, uh, I get uh, a ton from them, you know, again, fulfills that sort of creative aspect of my nature. Uh, there's also, you know, I love the sort of, in terms of designing them, I love the kind of balancing involved in terms of if you're going to offer a, a good game at least it better be balanced meaning that so we mentioned all the different paths to victory and ways you can win well if one's obviously way better than others there's not really multiple paths to victory there's only one right so what i mean is you better have the game balanced then right and what we mean by saying a game is balanced well balanced is that there's not one obvious strategy or path to victory that all players should take Right there, there's multiple viable routes. Okay, so if that's the case, then the game's well balanced. I like that process. I've always been really good at math. I, I mentioned right that I'm a, a stats nerd, and so naturally the math involved in designing these games appeals to me as well. Right, fleshing out, uh, you know how valuable certain tiles can be, in trying to to keep you know a certain standard. Let's say right. Um, Having to weigh these different factors, um, love that sort of aspect. I love the research involved as well. So you know, I mentioned how educational playing these games can be. Well, so too when you're designing these games, at least if you're, you know, worth anything, I think, right? If at least if it's going to be reflective of reality, right? Historically, then you're going to be doing some research, and so it's going to be educational for you. And I love that part of it as well. So. Um, some examples of some of my games where I've had to do research, really all of them entail, I would say, some degree of research for me, some way more than others. You know, I've made some games on you know, philosophy. That's probably going to take a little bit less of my time to, to research it since I already am familiar with a lot of it. But even that, you know, and I'll mention, um, what is it, two parts from now, if we ever get, ever get there. I'll mention uh, this game in more detail, you know, my philosophy related games, but you know, some of my, the first one I made that's philosophy related, Philosopher Kings, I still did a ton of research for. So even the ones I'm well versed in, the related to things I'm well versed in, right, I still invested a lot of time doing research and learning. And so, you know, psych, I have a game uh, on, you know, where you're a psychologist and I have a background in psychology as well, but I spent hours, you know, learning the nuances of the various, or familiarizing myself with the various nuances of the psychological disorders that the players will be curing as the psychologist in the game. Um, you know, sp what sports cards or what coins are the most valuable historically. I researched that when I made my games on coin collecting and collecting, you know, sports cards. So a lot of the, the research involved, I, and I, again, I like that process. So, um, love those all i mentioned three different elements right sort of this sense in which it satisfies my creative desires right uh mentioned so again sort of how they're educational and require me to uh, do some research and then finally the, the second thing i mentioned right the math elements involved in balancing the game i love all those different aspects and i thought i'd mention real quick give you an example i'm not going to spend too much time detailing this here but uh, getting an experience where they, that I remember sort of all three of these things, um, you know, coming to the forefront and being the case, right? So, 
again, going back to that experience I had in the UMKC mentor or scholars program, they would uh, put you in contact with various mentors throughout the process, you know, people who had their own projects and were successful and so on. And one of the mentors I uh, worked with and met with on a few occasions, you know, he was familiar with uh, my fantasy football, the board game. And mentioned how oh that would be awesome he thought it would be really cool to he was a big college basketball fan particularly the, the kansas jayhawks and mentioned how it would be awesome to be, have that the same experience but with college basketball and so boom you know he mentions that and all of a sudden i'll get into my design process and again i think two parts from now but uh, you know once i get an idea oftentimes again given my obsessive nature I homed in on it and that was, I had to get a game out. And so that was actually the impetus then for, what was this, game number 33. So I pulled this out of the door for this discussion, fantasy basketball, the board game. Then I, you know, it was, what was the impetus for it? Him suggesting this. I actually have a vivid memory of this as we had a beer at the time, him saying all this stuff. And I remember thinking, oh, that's actually a good idea. It would be kind of, I mean, I was more into basketball at that time as well. And the Jayhawks were doing, particularly well, I believe, at the time. And so, you know, I was like, wow, that, that really um, does seem like a good idea. And so going to the sense in which this feeds my need to be creative. Well, how do I make this game? How do I capture basketball, you know, on a, in, a, on a, in a board game? So I had to be creative and I went through the process and fleshed things out and over time, you know, created basically a board game where not only you're playing basketball, but uh, like my football game, where you're then also putting together a team based on whether it's real legends, contemporary real players, or ridiculous, you know, Sesame Street characters, or just yourself. You can even create yourself, right? It's fantasy basketball, the board game, and, right? So I created all that, all right? I went through different, uh, made boards here. These are different versions that I had. And again, having to flesh all this stuff out, exercise, right, that, that creative component of my nature, figuring this stuff out. How does this go? So, I think this might have been the finalized board, put that together, something like that. Anyway, um, so I had to get creative and figure out how to capture basketball in a board game. You know, how do you do that? Um, you know, I'm not going to get into that here other than to just say, you know, I had to figure that out and engaging in, in that creative sort of process. Uh, I had to balance things, right? So, um, so one of the things, you know, I did, as I mentioned, you had all these different players and they had the different ratings and those ratings would affect, um, different things that happen in the game. So, you know, you can attempt to steal. Well, that hinges on their ball you know the player with the ball your opponent's player with the ball their ball handling rating and it also hinges on your own player's steal rating and so there's all these different ratings and so you know i didn't want certain players overly powerful granted that you know i want the michael jordans and so on to be really really good i didn't want you know certain ones to necessarily be too good and so there's that sense in which the whole point being you want to balance things, you want to balance things. How do I make it so that there's this even back and forth sense uh, and not where one person's taking, you know, doing 10 different things on their turn before the other person then gets their turn, right? How do I accomplish all these things? How, again, how do I balance the underlying ratings and numbers? Um, how do I, in that game, I remember, right? How do I even determine whether a shot's made or not, right? I had to involve di dice rolls, but I didn't want too much of that, right? How do I factor in the players and their ratings and then at the same time factor in these dice rolls? And, you know, how do I then balance that based on the different spots in the court where they're at, right? Um, right? So out here, I want it to be a certain chance that they make it with a certain rating versus in here and so on, right? So that's all requiring in this balancing. And then speaking to the third thing, right, that sense of education and research uh, I, again, I'm a spat, sports nerd. Uh, I know a decent amount of basketball, but I was never necessarily a basketball fanatic. So I was familiar with, you know, most of the, you know, legends and their names, but I wasn't necessarily 
um, you know, I didn't necessarily know who the top 10 rebounders were of all time or, or anything like that. So I would literally then, and doing this game, designing this game, I went in and looked at all the stats. I, you know, I, I know who the top, who had, at least I did at the time, right? Who, led, who has the most steals of all time, uh, who has the most assists and so on. <coughs> Excuse me. So again, speaking to how much research is involved in the design process. And I really do enjoy Excuse me. I really do enjoy all three of those those component parts, right? Um, the creative aspect, the balancing of the numbers and the, the math and the stats involved, right? And then the the generally the research that you have to do to accurately portray at least whatever it is that your game's about. So, um, yeah, I got into. Is that everything I wanted to say? I think that might be uh, everything I wanted to say. Again, I ran through a lot in this part, this part three here, where I was basically speaking to what the value um, of playing and designing these strategy board games is. So that's been part three. Now in the next part, part four, we'll go ahead and dive into and take a look at my collection. So you've already seen through all these various initial parts right, different games in my collection. But we'll take a, a deeper dive, a, a closer look at my collection, and I'll give you some, some stats, if you will, and talk a little bit about how it was that I came to acquire the games I have. Okay, so as mentioned in this part, part four, we're gonna take a closer look at my collection. So I gave this part a lot of thought, you know, how do I want to go about doing this? getting into my collection and I came up with kind of three things I want to do so I'm going to start off by kind of giving some general remarks regarding my collection kind of give an overview if you will of how I came to acquire the games I, I did and what that process has been like uh, and so on and so forth and then in the second sort of section of this part four where I get into my collection I'm going to discuss a couple of my favorite designers and show off if you will a couple of their games and then also in that second section, I'm going to cover some other noteworthy games in my collection. So I basically went through all my various games and I had to be kind of selective, right? Because this is already a long episode, um, so I couldn't pick too many, right? But I uh, basically went through and sort of pulled certain games off the shelf that were noteworthy for various reasons. So again, we'll, we'll get, and get into some of those games and then we'll conclude this part by uh, offering a video tour of my collection and as we'll see uh, we've got games in various parts of the house uh, that's happened over the years they sort of uh, start accumulating in various spots my wife of course loves it but that's the game plan for this part let's go ahead then and dive in and you know first I want to start by offering some general remarks about my collection so again I got into gaming about 15 years ago and you know, over the time, that time, right, so it's, we're going on almost a couple decades, my collection has grown and grown and grown. Of course, uh, the space with the family and whatnot has kind of become less and less and less. And so those two things, um, at some point, right, that was going to be going to become an issue. And that's that's happened here in recent um, years. So I'll get more into that here in a moment. But uh, I have been sort of growing the collection it started when i started playing settlers of Catan. you know i picked up a few games at that point including settlers of Catan. uh was one of the first ones i, I actually purchased uh, and then you know steadily i've been acquiring more and more games up to this point so i you know literally have over 800 games at this point uh, in the collection so um you know how did i go about acquiring these games i talked a little bit about how how long i've been acquiring them for um, how did I go about doing it? That's been interesting in itself. Um, at first, when I first got into gaming, you know, way at the beginning, uh, I was, uh, you know, just in love with the hobby and kind of blinded by this new obsession. And I just wanted to try whatever I can get my hands on. And so my strategy with respect to strategy board games at the time was to get as many as I could, right? And to try as many things out as possible. So. At that point, back then, uh, I was all about sales, right? Um, at the very beginning, you know, a, a couple of good friends and myself, we bought, you know, a couple games, uh, Settlers of Catan, Agricola, and a couple others from our friendly local gaming store. I should throw that in there. 
But very shortly after that, I would check out the sales. This is what I was getting into of online vendors. And, you know, when they would have sales, of course, that happened at various times of the year and generally you know, with respect to holidays. But whenever they'd have sales, I would jump on those and, you know, get a bunch at a time. And I remember at the time I'd go on Board Game Geek and try to solicit like um, feedback and recommendations from other Board Game Geeks uh, on the site. And I'd say, I'm, I'm choosing from all these various ones I have. My budget's X amount. Which ones would you take? And I remember some uh, users commenting, well, these all, you know, they're okay, but there's no really good games. Why don't you instead, you know, put your money towards a few less games, but that are really good. And my take, as I mentioned at the time, is I can appreciate that opinion, but you know, at this stage, I'd rather with the same amount of money be able to become exposed to more of the games, right? And take on more themes and more mechanics and so on. So again, I could appreciate the both sides at the time. And what's interesting is at that time, when my collection wasn't that large, I could afford both monetarily and in terms of space, especially, uh, to go ahead and, and buy games in bulk, right? But what's interesting then is over time, again, as the space has become more and more of an issue, the strategies had to change. Uh, I guess it's maybe a tactical move on my part, right? I've had to, to adjust and uh, become much more choosy uh, as time has gone, gone, gone along here. And in fact, uh, you know, it's come to the point where I'm having to, my, my mother, she has uh, you know, plenty of space. She lives on her own and uh, there's storage there. And in fact, there's unused shelves. And so I've started moving some of the collection to her house. Again, we have four kids and they acquire more and more stuff as well. We're just sort of uh, maxed in terms of what we can fit here anymore. So I've been forced as a result of that to, to in some sense, downsize. So not only can I not keep buying more and more in bulk, I have to, if I do buy games, I, I kind of have to pick a few then to um, demote, so to speak, or move to my mother's house. And I shouldn't say they're, they're not like the worst of the worst of my collection that I moved there. We like having various games there. It's nice to have a, you know, a part of the collection there. When we visit, you know, we can pull out games as well. And the whole plan then is down the road when the kids move out, you know, I don't want to get rid of the games. I actually like all the games in my collection and having all of them will probably turn, you know, if I have my way, at least, who knows what my wife would say, but I I envision turning one of the rooms uh, into a gaming room, right? And then getting all my games back, having a nice uh, library of games, you know, with all the games in one room, whereas right now they're scattered all over, including at different properties, right? So it's been interesting, uh, again, how the process of acquiring my games has changed over the years and sort of how my strategies have has had to change as well. My strategy has had to change. Um, so I've gone from, I mentioned, initially ordering in bulk from, you know, online vendors, particularly when they had sales, sales to scaling it way back and being much more choosy. And so one thing we've started doing a lot that I've uh, done, I don't, I don't even remember the last time I actually ordered online um, from a vendor. You know, occasionally if I see a game fairly cheap on Amazon or Target, I might Pull the trigger on it but actually where i tend to acquire most of my games in the last few years is from half price books uh, surprisingly they actually have a nice selection of used board games often and sometimes new ones and with my teacher discount we actually get 10 percent off so my kids uh, not only do i enjoy books but obviously if you're familiar with my channel you know i love uh my i love books as well so my you know not only do i love board games but i love books uh, as do my kids so we all loved going to half price uh, books and that's actually where I've acquired most of the games that uh, I picked up in recent years. So that's been the newest sort of trend for us. But again, even then I have to be very, and it's hard because every time we go, there'll be some new stuff there. Oftentimes games I've never even heard of and that are highly ranked. And it's hard for me to, to um, say no to, to those kinds of games. Um, but that I've been forced uh, again, given these practical considerations to do just that, to be much more choosy. Um, but I do plan, like I said, to, uh, once the kids are out or at least the oldest convert or the oldest two, probably, um, once they're both out then convert one of their rooms then into a gaming room, at least that's how I see things happening. As I mentioned, who knows what my wife has in mind. Um, a couple like interesting, 
uh, tidbits as well here that I'll throw in. Uh, one thing that I'm kind of a stat nerd, as I've mentioned. Uh, so one quirky thing that we do uh, that, again, I have kind of initiated was we like to keep track of all the times we played the games. I used to do that on Board Game Geek, but that's just too tedious to go online and have to enter all those when we play so many. Uh, but we'll keep a piece of paper in pretty much every game, uh, every box of a game that we play. And we'll write down the date after we play, we'll write down the date and uh, what everybody's score was, just so we can kind of have a record of it. Again, I'm a kind of a stat nerd, so not that uh, other gamers do this necessarily, but it's kind of one thing um, that we do as well. And my kids enjoy as looking back as well and on how we've done over the over the months, over the years, uh, playing the same game. That's kind of kind of fun. Uh, also, being the stat nerd I am, I've mentioned Board Game Geek quite often. I've mentioned how you know there's ratings, and you can go on there and rate the games, uh, and then use those ratings to see you know every all the geeks or the users on there are free to to rate these various games, and then you can use that the average rating to kind of affect your you know to to uh, factor into your decisions. And so I like rating the games as well. Just throwing out some uh, numbers, I went and looked at my profile. So as of today, I had rated 438 games. Uh, so my collection is actually much higher than that. Um, I rated games not only that were necessarily, uh, they didn't necessarily have to be in my collection for me to rate them. Maybe I'd played somebody else's game. Right? But I always play them at least a few times, usually before I um, rate them. Maybe I played them online, but don't own a copy myself. Right? That might be the case. But, um, one way or another, I rated 438 games with my average rating being for what it's worth. Right? How many of you actually cared? Who knows? 6.37 is my average rating. So as I like to tell my kids, sometimes I like to ask them after we play a new game, what's your rating? Um, I, and as I always mention to them, I'm, uh, I'm a difficult grader, so to speak, when it comes to these games. So my average rating, or at least I think so, is a 6.37. A lot of times you'll see people's average ratings being 7 or 8 or whatever. Um, but just throwing that out there for what it's worth. My highest rated game is by, again, my favorite designer, uh, Wolfgang Kramer, and Michael Kiesling, and that's Torres. That uh, rates a 9.3 for me. I checked and I had six games out of the 438 that were rated that were a nine or higher, so not many. And then I went to the lower end of the scale, and I, the lowest I had was, the lowest you can rate at least, I guess, I'm not sure if you can rate below a one, but that's the lowest rating I give. And I gave two games a one, tic-tac-toe, and shoots and ladders. So I mentioned shoots and ladders before uh, as, you know, a game I'm not a big fan of. Um, absolutely, you know, no decisions. You go to where the space it says, and then a lot of times you might, you know, it's been a long time since I've played, but as I recall, you could be almost, you know, there to win, and then just because of what you spun, right, have to go all the way back or significantly back. Not a fan of that sort of game. I hate tic-tac-toe. Uh, when we go to a restaurant, a lot of times on the piece of paper, you know, for the kids, they'll have various games and one's tic-tac-toe. And inevitably, one of them will still ask to play, you know, the youngest typically. And I'll just grit my teeth when that happens because I'm not a fan of tic-tac-toe. Um, anyway, so those are some nerdy sort of things. So that's kind of the, some general remarks. I'll move on now to discuss, as I intimated earlier, a couple of my favorite designers, I've already mentioned one, uh, Wolfgang Kramer, but then I'll also discuss Richard Garfield, who I would consider probably, those two are probably my favorite um, designers. And I'd say Wolfgang Kramer is slightly above if I had to choose, but they're both, I, I have a lot of respect for both of them. And then I'll get into, again, some of my more noteworthy games in, the, in my collection. I can't, right, show them all off. Uh, but we'll go through some of them that stood out for various reasons. So that's the game plan here in the second section. Uh, for, first, I'll start with Wolfgang Kramer. I already mentioned Torres in previous parts as well. That's my most highly rated game. Uh, love the, the balance of the gameplay. Love the simplicity of the rule set, and yet the depth that the rules afford nonetheless, right? It's, that's just um, gameplay elegance to me. That's just... Uh, it really hits the sweet spot in terms of being really easy to learn and teach and yet at the same time be really hard to master in some sense. You're always learning, as I mentioned in previous parts, where you're always learning more and more, even hundreds, literally hundreds of games in, I was still seeing different play styles that were effective uh, when I was initially playing this online. So love that game. I have all sorts of his games in my collection and you're gonna have to excuse me, I got games all over here. so. Uh, 
I'll be tossing games aside here and there. Uh, I brought, let's see, I mentioned El Grande before. This is one of his that he is really highly rated as well. Um, this is one of the first few that I added to the collection as well. It's a um, territory control game where uh, you're trying to possess different areas that are worth various points, right? And so you're kind of trying to get other players right uh, out of these various areas that you're trying to control for these various points and really clever mechanics in terms of how you get your guys out there which are of course cubes on the board but uh really like this one and that's been in the collection for quite some time that's el grande um again i have a ton of his games probably like 15 at least in the collection here's a random one that i pulled off the shelf that he did with Richard Ulrich. He oftentimes will team up with different designers. Uh, so here's a random one. And then I wanted to show off to call as well. This is a really cool, um, show off the back of the board. I won't necessarily open it up, but really cool uh, thematic game that I played very early on. It was one of my uh, initial board game acquisitions, the physical copy, but I also played online a long time ago and so played this one a lot so i have fond memories when i was first getting into gaming of playing this one it's fairly easy so uh you know it almost is a gateway game it i can't remember yes it was spiel des Jars, the winner so uh right here a lot of these games actually or at least some of them you'll notice as we go through them were spiel des Jars winners so that's the major most highly coveted board game award they hand out every year and to win that particular award, the, the major one, Spiel des Jahres, it has to be, it can't be a super long game. It has to have fairly wide appeal and be fairly accessible to, uh, you know, it can't just be a, a niche crowd. Uh, it has to have some general appeal. And it's a big deal if you win. And so this was a, a one in a 1999. So that's one that was published. Uh, I like, again, the theme, you're exploring a jungle, exploring different temples and treasures. Uh, really cool, cool game that he did. One of the more highly rated games again, and one of the first few that I explored. So again, that's Wolfgang Kramer. Um, the thing I really appreciate about him or that stands out is again, the balance of his games. So there's lots of different strategies you can typically explore in his games and the game gameplay and mechanics are very well balanced. So um, they usually, I haven't really encountered a Wolfgang Kramer game that I don't like. Another one that stands out that I, I don't actually have the physical copy that I played a lot online is Hacienda. Uh, love that game as well. That's another one of his. But they're always, they always, and they typically play uh, in under an hour is another nice thing. Um, so love the gameplay. Typically short and sweet rule set, but that admits a lot of depth. So that's, those are the kinds of things that really stand out to me about Mr. Kramer and why I like his games. Mention Richard Garfield. So, He's the other kind of designer, as I was thinking about it, that I would say I have the most respect for. So this was hard. Rudiger, Rudiger Dorn is another great designer. There was all kinds of them. Who's the guy that did, uh, I'll mention Transforming Mars here in a bit. Jacob Firaxelis. I'm not sure how to say your name, Jacob. The guy that designed Terraforming Mars, great name. So picking my favorite designers was not an easy task, but I would have to say Richard Garfield's in that sort of top tier in, you know, sort of, general reasons. I mentioned why I like Wolfgang Kramer, what stands out about Garfield's games. Um, they're all unique. Uh, they seem to have like different themes and the gameplay and the mechanics are very innovative. Innovative, And so I'll just throw right off, out there, right off the bat, a game that a lot of you guys have probably heard of that will testify to his talent and the uniqueness of his designs. And that's Magic the Gathering. Richard Garfield's the designer of that. So that goes, um, I want to say early 90s. I actually don't remember when it was initially um, you know, published or, de or designed by him, but it goes way back every year. If you're not familiar, every year it's still being, they're still producing Magic the Gathering cards. So you know, Garfield, that really was his claim to fame. I remember when I was growing up, there were not only gaming stores, but actually stores specifically for Magic the Gathering. That's how big it was. Uh, in case I guess you're not as familiar with it nowadays, but you can go online, you can go, we bought, you know, a thousand random assorted uh, Magic the Gathering cards here. They send it to you in a box. I'm not gonna get into the gameplay, uh, but you know, that's a great game. I played it uh, online implementations and various electronic implementations, but then I have the physical copy as well. My son really likes the game. So that's 
one that I wanted to mention here at the outset, uh, Magic the Gathering, like probably his most well-known game. But I love a lot of his different designs. So another one I would mention is King of Tokyo. This, in my mind, is almost... It's not as good as Magic the Gathering. There's very few games in my mind that are as good as Magic the Gathering, but King of Tokyo is awesome as well. It's so good, in fact, that I have a couple different versions of it. They released a newer version that has a, uh, an additional game mechanic here in the last year or two. And this was the original version, and we have all the expansions and so on. The awesome thing about King of Tokyo, again, totally different sort of gameplay than, say, Magic the Gathering. What I like about it is you're playing with these, you know, awesome monsters. You're uh, trying to attack each other, but it's all in fun. And there's these quirky, uh, interesting um, sort of adaptations you can acquire for your monsters. And, and it's quick gameplay. And the other thing that I really like about not only King of Tokyo from Garfield, but a lot of his games, the thing that stands out in general, is that they uh, have wide appeal and they're pretty accessible, right? So King of Tokyo is a great example kids love it but then it's fairly easy and straightforward and there's enough strategy involved that adults can play it and have fun as well and not only that but whether they're gamers or non-gamers so we've played king of tokyo with the grandparents who you know they don't play these strategy games for the most part but they've played king of tokyo with myself and my kids uh so that's a, another thing that really stands out uh, stands out about uh richard garfield's designs is that they tend to be and they play really quick uh, typically uh, very unique, play quick, and have a wide appeal or uh, tend to be accessible to a large audience. Probably larger audience than most strategy games, I'd say. Which other one? Oh, so I wanted to mention Bunny Kingdom's another one of his recent designs. It's kind of a step up in terms of complexity. It would maybe be like not a gateway game, but the next step, maybe. Uh, my uh, third, or sorry, yeah, third born, uh, second youngest. She loves bunnies, and so this was an instant buy when it came out, maybe three years ago. And it's got, again, really clever gameplay mechanics. Uh, won't go, get into it too much, but uh, we've played this one a ton over the years. So that's Bunny Kingdom, another one of his. Richard Garfield's really good designs. I think that's, and we have, you know, uh, plenty more of Garfield's designs that I didn't get into. Um, that are arguably just as good, right? But again, I wanted to get into some other games as well. So those are the, I, I would suggest, probably my two favorite designers for what it's worth. Now I wanted to get into some other no games that seem noteworthy for various reasons. So let's go ahead and do that. You know, I won't spend too much time on Settlers of Catan because we've already talked about that and really already I've already you know mentioned why it's significant or noteworthy. And that's because it's really the first game that got me started, right? And that opened my eyes to the world of strategy board games, to the very notion that these kinds of games existed, right? So I have to pay, again, a debt of gratitude to Settlers of Catan, although I don't play it near as, nearly as often as I used to. Okay? Uh, another game, so, you know, various games, different reasons to point them out. This is going to be one that might be a little more difficult to get to. But here it is. So, you know, I thought, well, I better show them my most highly rated game. I mentioned how you can get on Board Game Geek, right, and rate all these games. And so I went into the, the collection and looked up what game do I possess that has the highest uh, Board Game Geek rating. I have the number four game on Board Game Geek, at, at least as of now, uh, end of July and 2022. And that's Gloomhaven, Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion. I actually haven't played this yet. This is perfect example of one of the games I come across at Half Price Bookstore, where I'm like, oh, what's this one? I look into it. It's, as it's described as, it's a fully cooperative fantasy campaign adventure. So the idea is you you don't just play it once, but you, you know, it's a campaign. So you'll play it several times. Uh, so you have to kind of keep that in mind, right? You have to have the same group of players and bring them back and um, to play the campaign. But anyway, Perfect example of the type of game where I wasn't that familiar with it, stumbled upon it at Half Price Bookstore, looked into it, and like, you know, it was a great deal and didn't didn't realize, you know, really that it even existed. And then it was the fourth highest game, you know, rated game. So um, there it is, number four, the most highly rated game in my collection. Having said that, 
what game I mentioned? All right, I haven't played that one. It's a. I just picked it up recently. What you know is the game I have that's most highly rated that I have played. I've alluded to this one earlier when I was trying to figure out what the designer's name is, and that is Terraforming Mars. So I want to mention Terraforming Mars. This is one of my favorite games of all time. This is one of the six that is a nine or higher, and I can't remember if it was a nine or 9.1, what exactly I gave it, not that it matters. Uh, but Terraforming Mars, this is noteworthy, again, because it's my, according to Board Game Geek, my, this, in my collection, it's the second highest rated game I have. Uh, and I also rated it very highly, so very noteworthy. And on top of that, this was last year's hotness. So one of the terms you'll come across on Board Game Geek if you explore it is the hotness. And that just basically means like what game or games you've been really into, or it could be a designer who have you been exploring recently. So the hotness for me last summer was this game. Uh, so I played it some with my son, but what was really great about this game, at least last summer when I had it out, pretty much for a month at a time, I would play it almost every day. What was really good is it's solo versions. Uh, there's actually a few different variants. I ended up picking up all the different uh, expansions for it. Right, we had colonies, uh, Venus, which we terraform as well with Venus next. Uh, turmoil, which is like adding a political aspect to the regular gameplay. Prelude, which is the first thing that came out that kind of gives you a little boost at the beginning. Uh, basically, the idea is you're running a corporation and that you're competing with the other players or, you know, that kind of changes in the solo variant. But the idea is in, in general, you're running a corporation uh, in an attempt to terraform Mars. And it's, again, one of those games that's very educational because a lot of the how it works and the mechanics are based on, right, the reality of the situation and needing to have a certain temperature, a certain amount of oxygen on the planet and so on. Uh, you have to have a certain temperature, a certain oxygen level, and then a certain number of oceans or water tiles placed on the board to then trigger the end, right? And the whole idea is, well, that's representative of what would actually be necessary to terraform and inhabit Mars. So I really like that. And they talk about how, you know, how the research that went into the game and so on and so forth, so forth. So love the thematic and educational elements of this game. But on top of that, love the solo variants and they wouldn't work. The game wouldn't be any good if, if the gameplay itself and the mechanics weren't great. And that's the thing that really stands out as well. Great theme, but also incredibly well designed. It's extremely well balanced, especially given all the cards and variables that are at play, given all these different cards. Um, love this game. Here's a look at the back. And somehow I did manage to get all the, this is extremely heavy because I put all of the, these are actually empty. I put all the expansions, somehow managed to get them in here. Uh, so that was last summer's hotness, so to speak. One thing that, while I'm talking about Terraforming Mars, and I mentioned how much I loved it, but as you acquire games and pick up games, one thing you might have to deal with is a game that has uh, is missing components or maybe something's off. And so at various times I've had to contact uh, publishers, right, when something was a foul or a miss. And that happened with respect to Venus Next. The cards were noticeably different than all the others. So um, just to throw that out there, too, that as you sort of um, put together your collection, you might encounter these various situations. And they're typically, it's annoying, uh, but they're typically, you know, handled eventually, right? So I remember there was quite a process. Uh, people weren't happy because, it, you know, obviously it wasn't just my copy. It was a copy or it was a, a, an issue for the first print run, I believe, of so anybody that got the per, a copy from the first print run encountered the same issue. Uh, but they did eventually, right, produce cards that were the same as the others, and they replaced everybody's copy. So I eventually did get replacement cards. As I mentioned, eventually, you know, I've never had a situation that wasn't eventually worked out. I, but there's been very some some very aggra aggravating situations. One time I got a game that where the components actually had mold all, all over them, and so. Uh, it took forever for somebody in that instance, I'm not going to name the name of the company, but it took forever for them to even respond to me. And by that point, I had cleaned off all the components myself because I didn't want you know, to be dealing with mold. Uh, and they eventually sent replacement parts, but it literally took literally took months. And I, as I said, I had to invest much a lot of my time um, anyway to clean up the, the components uh, uh, as well. So it was, that, that was one of the more annoying situations. Just one of, not a big deal, right? 
first world pro problems, but um, something that you might come across if you do get into gaming and you know start buying quite a few games. Uh, okay, so that was Terraforming Mars. Another game I have to say something about is Seven Wonders. So I think I alluded to this when I was talking about gameplay mechanics, right? Card drafting. So this game, I can't remember when it came out. Uh, it seems to me like this should have won Game of the Year. Maybe it didn't. Uh, it won some other game, it looks like. This is an extremely highly rated and popular game. The nice thing about it is it's got that sense of building a civilization, but a lot of civilization building games can, are notorious for taking a lot of time. Not the case here, the, as the box says, it plays in 30 minutes or less if people know what they're doing. And the reason, and it doesn't really, a lot of times when you add players, it's going to add to the game time, but that's not the case with Seven Wonders because a lot of what you're doing, you do simultaneously, right? You're all picking a card from hands at the same time and then passing them around. Then you take your actions basically at the same time. Uh, so games go by quick, even if you're playing with a large player count. So that's one thing that stands out about Seven Wonders. But it's very dynamic, very highly rated game, Seven Wonders, very quick and easy to teach. I haven't met too many people that don't like it. So had to give this a mention. And the re another reason to mention it is because it it produced or, produced or spawned like sort of a, a family of various games. So the regular Seven Wonders has two, three, or four expansions. I picked up, I think this is the latest one, uh, Babel. And it's got actually two sort of expansions within it that you can you can add one or both to the regular gameplay or the other expansions as well. So when you really, I mentioned, I think, like the big box in an earlier part and expansions. So basically the idea with expansions, if it wasn't clear up to this point, is you like the base game, the regular game, or if, I should say if a game does well, if it's successful, oftentimes then they'll add expansions, which add different sort of mechanics to the gameplay in one way or another, right? So there's all sorts of different ways that, exp that expansions can work. Some expansions are good. They really add to the base game. Sometimes they are add a lot of bloat and, uh, you know, are more trouble than they're worth and maybe add undue complexity. So expansions, in, in my experience, and most gamers, I think, would acknowledge are kind of hit and miss. It just depends. Again, a lot of times, I think it's a great expansion, but some people, you know, they might not be big fans of it. Uh, but not only so did the, the original Seven Wonders spawn various expansions, but then they came out with Seven Wonders Duel, which apparently did not win Spiel des Jahres either, but it did win all sorts of different uh, awards. Uh, this is actually even higher, rated even higher on Board Game Geek than the original Seven Wonders. It's a two-player version of Seven Wonders. It captures a lot of the same things that are going on from the original Seven Wonders, but again, it's a two-player, specifically two-player version, and there's still unique things going on that separate it from the original, and it's, again, arguably even better. Um, so, love this one as well. Uh, expansions for it. I picked up Agora, which I really like. Um, that's one of two or th three expansions that they have for Duel. And then one thing that's really cool about Seven Wonders Duel is they have then made the authors, actually. So this is officially approved and sort of put out Solo Variant. They've offered so Seven Wonders Duel Solo Variant, which you can then go and sort of print off these extra components. Uh, it's free to print off the extra components, and it's the, you know the, they provide the, the designers themselves provided the solo rules in, and I've loved that. That's actually been the hotness for me recently. I took this. It's so the nice thing about Seven Wonders Duel is you can take it anywhere. Right? Look how small it is. Took this on our trips out to Colorado recently and played several games of the solo with the solo variant, and it did a, it did a great job of capturing the gameplay of the the regular gameplay with two players right? and you can go up against caesar and aristotle and all these various leaders in the solo variant so love that wanted to mention that as well so that's sort of the seven wonders family uh great uh family of games if you will with lots of different ways to play again that's seven wonders speaking of solo play so i mentioned the solo variant there i wanted to mention here uh, another recent pickup. This is Friday. So I mentioned Power Grid, I think, in a previous 
uh, part of the episode. And the designer here, this is another prolific designer, designer Fredman Fries. I don't know if I actually said his name right. Uh, almost all of his games start with F. Power Grid obviously doesn't, and some of that was lost in translation. Uh, he's actually German. I believe all the games in the original, you know, his original language, which is German, start with an F, as does his name. Uh, but he's also a big fan of green, so his hair is green, uh, all his games are, boxes are green, and so on. But <clears throat> this is what's unique about Friday and why I'm bringing, up, bringing it, uh, it up, is that it's specifically designed as a solo game. And I guess another one that I just thought of is Honor Rim. Uh, that's another really good game that's designed to be solo, although I guess it can be played actually with more players. So I take that back. This one literally is designed for one player, right? It is a solo adventure, which is extremely highly rated. It's amazing what he packed into this little game. It's actually a deck builder. So you start off with a certain number of cards. I think it's 18, and they're all pretty bad. And so as the game progresses, you're trying to get rid of that those original cards in your deck and acquire you know, better cards to make your deck better. Right? That's the sense in which it's a deck builder. Uh, but does a, a great job. It's very challenging. I still haven't beat it, even on level one. I just started, uh, as I mentioned, I just picked it up. So that's Friday. Another game I wanted to talk a little bit about, a couple noteworthy things to say with respect to it, is Survive. First of all, one thing that kind of stands out to me about Survive is how long ago it was designed. I want to say in the early 80s, maybe like 1981 even. So it's been around for many decades. Uh, so that's something that stands out because most designer European or Euro strategy board games are a much more recent phenomenon. I would say uh, maybe the late 90s and then you know, beyond that. Uh, so at least, you know, obviously there were games that were designed back then, but not near as many and very few have stood the test of time are still being published as Survive is. Right? That, I guess that's the point. Uh, so that's very significant or noteworthy about Survive. Uh, another thing I guess I would say is that, that really stands out is how much fun we've had. It's a family game. Definitely, I would say a, uh, a gateway game. Right? It's, it's easy enough to play. There's only like three uh, parts to your turn. And it's it's thematic. It's fun to get it's easy to get immersed in. So the gist of it is you're all on this this island that's kind of slowly with each turn collapsing into the sea, and you need to get your particular dudes or dudettes from that island that's sinking onto the safe uh, areas at the corners of the board. Meanwhile, you have monsters and sharks and whales and so on that you have to try to avoid and try to get on boats and there's sort of some cooperative elements involved because you know you might not be on the same boat as some other players and their dudes or dudettes and so who gets to control the boat well whoever has the most dudes or dudettes on the boat and so there's interesting gameplay elements there's a reason why it stood the test of time uh, it's thematic uh, the theme appeals to a lot of people i guess as long as you're okay with you know trying to get the other players dudes and dudettes eaten by monsters and so on right there is there some of your a lot of your dudes and dudettes are going to die so as long as you're okay with that uh it's a great family game a great gateway game i would say that's survive another one one i wanted to discuss where is it all the way at the bottom of course is zuluretto so here we have another spiel de jar winner this one was the 2007 winner i have to mention zuluretto because it is probably received out of all the games in my collection, right? As a result of being a family man and having four, four kids, it has probably received the most playtime of any of the games. And that's by virtue right, of the fact that every one of my kids has loved this game, right? It's one of the most requested, especially early on. The gameplay is simple enough that little kids could play. I mean, honestly, I think my kids played it at five years old, if not even four. Uh, I mean, that's that's obviously going to be a challenge if they're that young. But the point is, this, the gameplay is simple enough that young kids can, can pick it up. And they look at the game, right? The theme, I should say. It's all about getting animals and making your own zoo. Every kid loves that idea. And many adults do, too. So another one of those games where it has wide appeal. It's, it's no surprise that it wants Spiel des Jahres. The kids are all going to love it. And it's got enough strategy, enough choices involved that parents won't mind playing either even gamer parents so zuloretto had a ton of time uh, play time for us we still play it occasionally my youngest is seven she still requests it 
so if I were to say, you know, pick one game, if you're just getting into games or this sounds interesting and, you, you know, you have a family and want to sort of get a game maybe for the family, Zuloretto definitely would be one of my top recommendations. I don't know how easily, easy it is to come across a copy at this point. Surely, given the appeal, the fact that it was a Spiel des Jahres winner, you can, surely you can get a copy. Uh, highly recommended if that's your situation or if the theme just sounds appealing to you. It's a, you know, it's a solid game. Another family, I don't know if it's family necessary, but necessarily, but a game that has spawned expansions, let's put it that way, that we've gotten into and played over the years. Did I bring in, I guess I didn't bring in the third, third box. I thought I did. We have, did I not bring in the bigger box? I thought I did, but so here's the original one. Then they had the big expansion and then they had, oh, here it is. Another big expansion. And there might even be, whoops, there might even be a bigger expansion. <laughs> so I, I, I'm not sure if we have all the expansions or just two out of three. Anyway, you can tell we've enjoyed this game, particularly my son. First thing I guess I would say, other than you see we've gotten into the expansions and then it has expansions, is uh, that this is one of the first ones that I added to my collection. So another noteworthy thing about it. The other really cool thing about this game is the theme and what you're doing. You're putting together, uh, it's kind of, the gameplay consists of two different parts, right? Part one, there's like three or four rounds. The first part of each round, you're putting together, there's three, I think there's three rounds. You put together your spaceship, which is really cool. It's this real-time deal where everybody's reaching in, getting components at the same time and trying to add various components to their spaceship, and you're building a spaceship. Those components might be like, batteries to power up various parts of your spaceship or they might be laser guns right you might try to boost your strength or they might be um uh what do they call them like places where uh, hubs where your people can be so you can get more guys or girls on your ship uh so you're you're building your ship and then part two of each round you're sending that ship uh, on an excursion on an adventure as are all the other players with their ships and you encounter all these foes and you hope to make it to the end without your ship falling to pieces. So, you know, you're going to encounter battles and so on. Really cool theme, a lot going on, especially if you add in the expansions. Uh, it can be pretty, uh, take a relatively simple game and make it much more complex. So this might be an example in my mind where if you add all the expansions, it can be too much. Uh, but we got into it and my son loved it. He actually is the one who acquired the expansions. Oops. Is the one that ex acquired the expansions. Obviously, we played this one a lot, really like it. Uh, if, the, the, if the theme sounds appealing at all, definitely worth your while to pick this one up. Uh, I don't know how to say the guy's name. This is another very well-known designer, Vladish Shavatel. He's created a ton of different games. In fact, I have many in my collection. This is probably our favorite by him, but wanted to mention again that he's one of those designers that's up there in terms of the tiers. Didn't quite make tier one for me but very noteworthy designer. That's Galaxy Trucker. Then we have, I wanted to talk briefly about Raw. Speaking of a really well-known designer, Reiner Knizia, arguably out of all these designers, he might be the most well-known. They call him Dr. Nitsa, Nitsia. I don't know, again, another guy, I don't know how to say his name. Uh, he's, I believe he has a, a PhD in mathematics. Uh, so as, needless to say, his games are very well-designed are very well balanced. They tend to be on the quicker end of the spectrum. He's won many uh, Spiel des Jahres awards. He has a lot of super popular games. In fact, I, he might be the one that I have the most games by out of all the designers, him or Kramer probably. Uh, so I have a ton of his designs, another very popular uh, designer, very well known, maybe even arguably again, the most well known. Now, the reason why though, that's actually none of that's why I, wanted to bring this up. The reason why I bring it up is because this is the one my dad loves to play and that we've played a lot with extended family when we go up to Nebraska and get together over Christmas and so on. Raw comes out. My dad, this is in fact probably the one, the only game he'll really play in terms of strategy board games. He really likes it. Uh, we played it so much that I almost grew tired of I did grow tired of it for a while to the point where I, I didn't even want to play it. And it's a really good game, really well designed. Not true anymore. I, you know, I, I'm willing to play it now because we took some time off from it, but uh, great game, uh, very easy to teach. Again, this is the case with most of his games, plays relatively quickly. Uh, it's an auction game, so 
depending on what's out there, that's another type of uh, gameplay mechanic, right? Depending on what's out there, you might want to bid a little bit more, right? And depending on what other people have bid, you know, how high do you want to bid? So you're bidding with these suns, uh, which have different values on them, <clears throat> right? How uh, do you want to put your high numbered or high valued sun out there because the stuff's really good? Or do you want to try to wait and uh, see if it comes back around you and, and is even better, right? So those are the kinds of choices you have to make. And it's an auction game. And I, I tend to like auction games, actually. And so it's no surprise that I like raw as well. I made it sound like, you know, I really grew to despise this game. That's not the case. I, we've played it a ton, and I, I do enjoy it. It's a good game, uh, very good auction game, I would say. Okay, then the last one, well, a couple more here. The One of the ones I wanted to mention would be Smash Up. So this is one where... Sometimes there's discussions of whether a game's fiddly, and what that means is there's a lot of keep, a lot of stuff to keep track of, uh, maybe a lot of components, a lot of calculations. And when I first started playing Smash Up, that was my immediate sentiment that you, know, you have all these bases out there, and then you're placing different dudes on these different bases, and so are all the other players, and they have all kinds of different effects, which are then affecting one another, and so on. And so on. That was my immediate reaction. But over the years. The theme is really good, and over the years, you sort of learn, you know, you catch on on how to make the calculations a little quicker and so on. The point is, over the years, it kind of grew on me. I still think it's true that some of that calculation can be tedious, but Smash Up is a game that, that my rating of it has gone slightly up over the years. And we, for a while there, we played it so much that, so the kids really like it. That's another reason why I'm bringing it up here and why we played it so much. Uh, for a while there, we picked up every expansion that was coming out. Now, the last three or four years, that's not been the case. Uh, but we had to, you know, we have all the various expansion boxes. You could get the big geeky box, which came with a few unique things, and then gives you a lot more space to put all the, the basically it's a card game, really. Every component is, if I recall, is a card. So you can keep everything, right, in this nice, neat box. This is a very heavy box, because we have a ton in here. Uh, but what's cool and unique about this game, as the name implies, is every game you're going to take two different, I think they're called factions, two different groups, and they all these groups are types of things, grandmas, aliens, dinosaurs, these are just examples. All of them have a deck of 20. You're going to take two of these factions and smash them up before the game, basically shuffle them together, and that's your combo then, and you're going to take on every, all the other players who are doing the same thing. So you can have Really cool combinations, dinosaur grandmas, dinosaur aliens, uh, dinosaur rock stars, ant, spiders, you know, they have had all kinds of things over the years. So cool concept, cool theme, gameplay is pretty simple, but, you know, is it fiddly? There's an argument for, for that, I think. Um, a lot of calculations involved. But anyway, this might be an example of another gateway game. I'm not sure with, again, the calculations, but a lot of people consider it a gateway game. So that is Smash Up. I guess the last couple games I'd mention is the recent hotness for us. And I, what I mean by that, again, hotness is what's been hot around these parts, so to speak, right? What game, games have been reaching the table? Uh, and those would be recently for us, again, a lot of it's dictated by being with my kids, especially over the summer when they're at home throughout the day. Two games that really stand out that we just picked up pretty recently, Point Salad and Just One. So I'll talk very briefly about each one of these in turn. Let's start with Just One. Actually, a Spiel des Jahres winner, Game of the Year 2019, so we have another one. This gameplay is so simple that I'll actually explain it. Uh, in fact, it seems so simple that I couldn't really believe it was Game of the Year when I first sort of explored it. Uh, what's happening, it's, what's unique about it is it's uh, a cooperative um, cooperative game where you're, you're trying to work together to get a certain score and then try to better your score. Um, and so how it works is, and it's always 13 cards that you start with, so you, you uh, take 13 of the cards, so you take 13, and then somebody starts, and so what they do is they put, you draw from the deck, so your deck of 13, you put it on there, and then whoever drew the card, they say a number, one of the five. And so let's say they said three. So what happens then is everyone else has to 
write on their thing, they have a little marker, they have to write one word that will be, offer, be offered as a clue then, hopefully, we'll see here in a second if it is, they'll write down one word, all right, let's say we're doing this, I'm going to write down this one, okay, so the catch is though, let's say we're playing four players, so there's one person that drew it, the other three, once everybody gets a one word down, they don't share Right, until everyone's got one, then you they will reveal amongst themselves, not the person that has to guess here in a moment, right? They'll reveal amongst themselves the one word that they each put down. And if there's any that are the same, food might be too common, right? Somebody else might have put that. If that's the case, then if anything's duplicated, you got to put it face down. The person who has to guess, the catch is they won't be able to see that word then. So you want to come up, what's unique and interesting about it is you want to come up with a word that will clue the person in but that's not going to be so obvious that other people might or are inclined to also put the same word because then it'll just cancel out. But then there's like double think, right? Well, I'm not going to put it because somebody else is, but then maybe they're thinking the same thing. And so nobody ends up putting it right. Uh, lots of interesting psychological sorts of deals like that, I would say. And then make the game after I played it, I'm like, oh, I see uh, there is, you know, enough going on here where this game does seem pretty interesting. And, Again, we really enjoy it. Everyone, super simple to explain, as is the case. I literally just explained it in like two minutes, probably, uh, as compared to, say, an in-depth war game that might take you know, access and allies. It took us three hours to, to learn and set up, right? Super quick. You can see why then this one game of the year, uh, because there is, even though it's super simple gameplay, there's still some depth involved and. In, you know, you, you have to do some thinking, uh, come up with a, a, a word again that's going to be good, but not too good in some sense, right? So we've been enjoying just one, and it's also compatible with a number, you know, a nice variety of players. It plays three to seven. So the other one I'd mentioned that, and so this obviously highly rated, another highly rated game that I came across at Half Price Bookstore, hadn't even heard of, looked it up. It was a super cheap, sounded good to the kids, and super highly rated. Point salad and loved it. The kids loved it. We played it a ton here this summer, so I picked it up this summer. It's so easy that, uh, again, I can give you an idea of how it works. Right? You take a certain number of cards out based on the number of players. There's six different vegetables involved. And what's interesting, so you'll have the same number of uh, each of these six ve vegetables in play. Uh, so you take a certain number, equal number of each of the six vegetables out of play, depending on the number of players. And what's interesting is literally every card in the game, they're dual sided, right? So it's carried on one side, but then on the other, it offers a unique way of scoring. So throughout the game, you can, on your turn, super simple, you either take a card, a scoring card that is, there's three available, or you take one of the vegetables that's available down below in the market. And so you're either taking one point card or you're taking two vegetables. And so you're going to acquire point cards and vegetables throughout the game. And, you know, at the end, you might have, let's say, five point cards and 12 vegetables and various sorts. Maybe you're not trying to get onions and you're trying to get lots of carrots because, for example, maybe you have this card. Well, actually, there's no minus for an onion, but maybe you have my, uh, you, you're trying to, to avoid cabbages right, and get lots of carrots because in this case, you're going to lose points for cabbages, but gain points for carrots. So. Again, another super simple game to learn, but a lot of depth given all, that all the scoring cards are unique. And, you know, there's different ways to play. Do you try to just get tons of scoring cards? Well, you don't want to get too many because then you're not going to have any vegetables to garner the points from the scoring cards, right? Do you uh, instead try to just get tons of vegetables and only a, a couple of the scoring cards? Well, if you don't get enough scoring cards, then... You might have a ton of vegetables, but you're not generating points because you don't have enough point cards. Uh, I've seen a particular point card earn like 35 points. So a lot of them, you know, you're happy to get, say, 10, right? So it's really, again, super simple gameplay, but tons of like strategies you can explore nonetheless. So uh, very compelling gameplay. Again, super easy and accessible to, to anyone. We brought this to a family reunion recently and people enjoyed it there. So that's the recent hotness, again, just one, and point salad. Uh, 
So here we've gone through and I've given you a little spiel on a couple of my favorite designers and gone through and discussed some of the more noteworthy games in my collection. I want to end this part four where we're talking about my collection by giving you a brief video tour of the collection, including at its various different locations. So why don't we go ahead and do that? Okay, so we'll start our exploration of the collection in the basement hallway, which is really where I started putting the collection together when I first uh, started exploring strategy board games, you know, 15 plus years ago. This is pretty much where the games were stored exclusively. And then, you know, over the years, as the collection's gotten bigger, of course, I've had to move, you know, and you know, expand the locations I store them at. And this used to house my favorites, but that's kind of changed over the years. It's become more of a, where can I put this particular game? Where can it fit? As you can see by the fact that we have games stored from uh, floor to ceiling. And here we move to my son's room. He has a couple shelves full of games, again, floor to ceiling. Uh, these games tend to be on the lighter end of the spectrum and tend to be oriented more towards you know, a younger audience, in particular, you know, themes that he finds appealing. So here's the other other shelf in, in his room then. And, you know, over the years, we've had to get really resourceful. And we're even keeping games in the utility room here. So in this case, we're stacking them from ceiling to floor. Uh, yeah, we have, again, two shelves full of games. Uh, in the utility room here. Here we have, I mentioned big box, big boxes area. Anyway, that's where I store a lot of those. And uh, again, we have games all the way up to pretty much the ceiling. And we'll end the tour by heading out to the garage where I store a lot of the older games and the games I'm not as fond of, I'll be honest. And with that, we'll go ahead and wrap up uh, this part, part four, where we've taken a closer look at my collection. Now, at this point in this episode of Experimenting with Existence, as we take a closer look here at some pictures throughout the house of board games in various locations. In fact, I'm not sure there's a room in the house anymore that doesn't have a board game or two. But it occurred to me that, you know, this episode, you know, it's going on for quite some time and that it would be best maybe to ha have it in two parts or two, I'm sorry, not parts, I shouldn't use that word, but two, have two videos for it. So I'm going to wrap up the first video here. So this first video will be parts one through four. And then the next video, we'll go ahead and move on to uh, parts five through eight. And so in part five, I'll move on to a uh, discussion of my act, my designs. So I mentioned all along here that I've been designing strategy board games from the get-go since I started playing them. So again, I'll start talking a little bit more about uh, my designs themselves.